Because I can't tell because it's 20 seconds. Okay. Come on. You're live, Mark. Cool. So hi, everyone, and welcome to Science Untapped, where we're going to get to untap into some science. I'm Mark Richardson, the Education Outreach Officer for the Arthur B. McDonald Canadian Astroparticle Physics Research Institute. Um, and I'm here in Kingston today. Um, and personally, I have a PhD in astronomy from Arizona State University. And I study how galaxies form and change over time. But what really like kind of makes me uh, enjoy my day is uh, the opportunity to share kind of science with everybody um, that wants to kind of partake with all. And so I love taking those opportunities. And I realized that like during this difficult time that is right now of you know, COVID, something that's having a, a really heavy impact on us all with different impacts for different people, that it'd be great to kind of highlight some of the, the diverse things that we are learning in science during this time of COVID and in the context of COVID. So tonight we have three scientists to speak to this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting to just kind of sit back, listen and learn. And so I wanna acknowledge the privilege that we have to learn tonight from our respective homes which for me is on the lands of Kataraqui, now Kingston, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples and many indigenous peoples before them. And so I'm a settler from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the traditional land of the Skin Justice District of the Mi'kmaq, and also once the home of the racialized community of Africville. And so my ancestors took advantage of these people in the removal of their access to the land. And I reflect on this history because it's, it's a part of my identity and part of the privileges that define me. And so, I, I mean, I'm very privileged, not least because of the access to these spaces and lands on which I can live and grow and learn. Um, although difficult, particularly right now, especially when I'm here, sitting in my office at home, staring at a camera with a little green light, I'm used to doing these events in person. And when I do them in person, I take it as an opportunity to look at the audience, to look at the people that are coming, the people from our community that are engaging with that event. And likewise, the people in the community that are not there, that are missing. People from our community who likely have barriers to participation um, and inclusion in these events. And so I commit to helping to remove those barriers. Uh, but I recognize that in my position of privilege, I, I don't have these experiences. So I, I, I make it a priority to listen and to learn to people. I'm, I'm, I need to make them a priority really um, from those who have lived experience of exclusion. And in particular science, which you know, we're partaking in and we're learning about today, that's the pursuit of truths. And so this endeavor cannot work if society is not treating everyone equitably, allowing them to participate equitably. And so I need to kind of garner those relationships, relationships with indigenous people, with racialized people. Uh, and I want to kind of given that, bring some attention to a strike that's happening next week, um, particularly in science and academia. And it's called Strike for Black Lives. And it's occurring on Wednesday. And it's serving as a day of action for people of privilege like me to uh, further the cause of end ending anti-black racism. Um, and I recommend that people at home, if you want to learn more about this, look at particlesforjustice.org. They have a fantastic list of resources and of some actions that you yourself can do um, for this cause. And so to all of you, I urge you to think of the connection that you have with the land around you and the privilege that we have to learn here. Let's reflect on these and work towards decolonizing these spaces and to make them one of friendship, love, and access for all of those in our community. So, the plan for tonight is simple. I wanna make sure that you all have your drink on hand. I can assure you it helps the learning go down. It's a great pairing for the science. And we have three fantastic speakers tonight giving talks um, with some short rounds of fun trivia in between. But, well, let me get started. Before we get started, I want to warm up my insides and now my brain with some kind of quick science in the news. And so, in theory, I can share my screen, which of course, with technology, we're probably gonna run into some bumps tonight. So let me see how to do this. Do, do, do. And now, all right, so science in the news, this is, Part of this event, right, is really to just come back and relax and, and 
get the opportunity to listen to science happening. We run an event here called Astronomy on Tap. It's one of the satellite things that happen all over the world it's called Astronomy on Tap. It lets you just kind of sit back and relax. Um, we're happy today to make it Science on Tap, and we always start these off with a bit of astronomy or now today, science in the news. And today's theme is COVID, ways that we've learned about new things in a time of COVID. And so the first thing I wanted to focus on is kind of the act of, of us all staying inside, that industrialization's down. One of the cool things that this has led to is way less air pollution that's happening in the air around us. And so I have this beautiful picture from Chabar and Kathmandu, which for the first time in years, I think, you can actually see Mount Everest from the city. This is not something you can usually do. But digging into the science more, and maybe we'll hear about this a little bit later from one of our speakers, is um, satellite imagery of uh, exactly what's in the air. And so on the right, I don't know if you can see my cursor, it's actually looking at aerosols in the air over the last several years. And in 2020, you can see it's quite reduced. And so what they've done is they've actually taken 2020, subtracted 2019, so you can see how it's different. And there in bright blue, you see this huge reduction in the amount of aerosols that are in the air. So although, you know, there's a very kind of um, stressful kind of things happening with COVID, um, this is kind of a neat, a neat kind of change that we're seeing in the skies above us. And so the next thing I want to focus on is changes that we're seeing maybe in the animals around us. And it's the case that animals are noticing that we're not there. There's an absence. And this is seen, being seen in parks, like seeing all the deer that are coming out in Yosemite Park, um, basically where usually tourists are there, you know, filling up these spaces, but they're not there right now. Well, deer are coming out, bears are coming out. And so it's kind of exciting to see all this life that's not used to having access to those spaces. Uh, but of course, that could be a problem in a little bit when people start going back to the parks that maybe those animals are gonna be quite happy with having that space and so they could get a little territorial. So there's a concern about that. But some animals are already getting quite territorial and that would be to aggressive cannibal rats. I don't know if you've heard this, but rats in cities, like they greatly depend on all the waste that comes out of our restaurants at home, our restaurants in our cities. But those restaurants aren't working anymore, and so rats are, are running out of food, and they're finding a little bit more uh, uh, creative ways to find some food. And so if you live in an urban area, maybe you're experiencing some on some subways. And last but not least, going away from the animals and away from the sky altogether, I wanted to highlight that this past weekend, um, there was a pretty exciting thing that happened. I had to run in for mowing the lawn to watch it live on the television. And that is that a commercial company, specifically SpaceX, has successfully taken two astronauts to the International Space Station over the weekend. And this was originally scrubbed last week because of weather, and then they launched and it was perfect on the weekend. And this marks the first time that US astronauts have gone to space from US soil since the shuttle was retired in 2011. And so SpaceX is like, you know, this is really opening up um, what is gonna be the future of space travel. And uh, who knows where this is gonna go? Um, and as much as this is great for SpaceX, I do as an astronomer want to highlight that everything that's happening is not amazing. Um, so they also this week launched 60 more satellites into space from what's part of their uh, Starlink constellation. And it was really neat to see it happen, but in, in this, these satellites play an important role in the idea that they're going to be maybe bringing internet to some more remote areas to bring the information and the accessibility of the internet to more of an audience. Uh, in the meantime, these things are impacting some science that we're trying to do, like this image that was taken down in Chile. Uh, this is a picture, I think they were trying to study some distant galaxies, and these satellites flew across and, and ruined that image. Um, and this is a problem, but uh, yeah, hopefully we can maybe overcome this. So that's it. Hopefully that kind of whet your appetite for some taste of, of some science, but now I think I've spoken enough, so I want to um, move on to the main event. And so we can invite our uh, first speaker on. So we have Troy here. And Troy, do you want to share your video? I'll stop sharing my screen. Hi, Troy. So Hello. Tro Troy is, um, ooh, I've lost my bio for you. So our first speaker is Troy, uh, Troy Day here, um, now showing himself. And Troy is a professor and the associate head of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics and cross-appointed with the Department of Biology. So Troy, your research focuses on mathematical biology, specifically developing mathematical theories for the evolution of 
epidemiology of infectious diseases like we're currently dealing with. Um, so you're currently a member of the Ontario COVID-19 modeling consensus table. And I'm sure you're gonna tell us a little bit about what that means in your talk that you're gonna be giving called Modeling the Spread of Infectious Diseases. So Troy, I really look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and uh, um, thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing from other people and listening to the other talks tonight as well. Just gonna make sure my screen is up there so that everybody can see it. Uh, hopefully that's good for everybody. So as Mark said, I'm gonna talk about uh, modeling infectious diseases. And what I'm gonna do to begin with is I'm gonna start by maybe just giving you a bit of background, uh, both in terms of uh, where COVID-19 came from and some background in terms of how modeling has been used even in the early stages of the emergence of something like COVID-19 to try and get a better understanding uh, of where these things come from and how they might be controlled. And the best place to start in asking this question, where did, did COVID come from, is to show this uh, what's called the phylogenetic tree. So what scientists, scientists have done is taken the genome of a number of coronaviruses from different species, and you can see them all listed down the side here. And then they've constructed what is essentially a family tree of these coronaviruses. And so this tree here shows the interrelationships among these different uh, coronaviruses, coronavirus species, I should say. And the idea, like with any family tree, is the closer any two species are on that tree, the more recently they share a common ancestor evolutionarily. And so I'll just point out a few interesting features on this tree. So one first thing to notice is these ones that are in color down here. So this H cove there, here, and the two at the bottom. Those are coronaviruses that have been circulating in the human population already for quite some time. And those are the things that typically cause seasonal colds and that sort of uh, relatively benign infectious disease. Uh, other places in this tree that are interesting to look at, here's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which many of you may have heard of, which was a few years ago now. Uh, the 2003 SARS outbreak virus is found here at the top of the tree, sars cov and the current one that causes uh, COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2, and that's what appears right here in the tree. So very close to the, the coronavirus that caused SARS in 2003. And the other thing to notice is you can ask now, what is the most, uh, the most closely related um, coronavirus species to the current one that's causing COVID-19. And it's this one here, at least according to how this phylogeny has been constructed. And this is a coronavirus that's found in horseshoe bats. So that's led some to suggest that maybe there was some kind of transmission event from horseshoe bats to humans and then the ultimate spread within the human population. Um, of course, we know that it's spread uh, from some animal reservoir to humans. And in order to do that, typically what has to happen is there has to be some level of evolutionary adaptation to humans before it will be able to spread effectively in the human population. And so this is sort of just to give you a little schematic of, of what people think are important in this process. So here's a schematic of a virus cell. And this is a cell of a, a lung cell maybe, or whoops, something like that. And on the outside of the virus, you can see these little things sticking out. Those are what are referred to now as spike proteins. And it's those spike proteins that connect with receptors on the cells of, of human lung cells. And they bind and cause a docking event to happen that allows the coronavirus to then enter the cell. And so one of the things we now know is that these spike proteins differ quite a lot among different coronavirus species. And there had to have been some level of evolutionary adaptation of these spike proteins in order to be able to bind effectively to the receptors in humans. And the ones that are most thought to be most important in humans are what are called ACE2 receptors, which are found in the lungs and other places. Uh, and so there's some evolutionary adaptation that's happened in those spike proteins. And I'll just show you another slide. This is a bit ugly, but I'll just walk through some of the most important features of this. So here's the, a single virus at the top here again with these spike proteins sticking out. Here's the genome of the virus inside, a single strand uh, of RNA here. And now on this image, basically it's stretched out from one end to the other on, this, on the top of this slide. That's meant to be the genome. And these numbers just represent the location on the genome. There's about 30,000 base pairs in this genome, 30,000 sort of building blocks of the genetic material. And this particular part of the genome is what codes for those spike proteins. And if you zoom in on that part of the genome, which is what this second part of the image is here, this big long bar, the second one down, those are all of the different amino acids associated with the spike protein. And a particular part of that 
is important in the actual binding of this spike protein to human cells. And that's what the receptor binding domain is called. And so if you zoom further into that, that's what this very bottom image is here. And so these are different amino acids here. This top line is the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 in humans. And the boxes around these particular locations in the receptor binding domain, so there are six of them, one here, one here, two there, and these two at the end, those are now recognized as being critically important mutations that have allowed the, the coronavirus to now bind with the ACE2 receptors in human cells and as a result infect humans. And so you can now ask, well, what other coronaviruses also have those mutations? And if you look at the bat coronavirus that was closest in that phylogenetic tree, you can see that it doesn't actually have them except for this one. It's missing the other five, but the coronavirus here that's found in pangolins, and I'll show you a picture of pangolins on the next slide, it actually has all six of those mutations that are critical for uh, spreading within humans. And so that's led some to question whether, the, whether it's horseshoe bats or pangolins or some kind of complicated mixture, maybe a recombination event, or maybe some other species of coronavirus that has yet to be sampled that is ultimately the ancestor of the one that's spreading in humans. And so there's still a bit uncertainty, I would say, in terms of exactly what the animal reservoir is that immediately preceded the spread in humans, but it has likely to do something, something to do with the coronaviruses that are closely related to those in horseshoe bats and pangolins. Um, now, from the standpoint of mathematical modeling, uh, one of the things you can do is model this process of evolutionary emergence. And you might be interested in doing that because it allow, would allow you to sort of identify uh, scenarios and areas where maybe there's a greater likelihood of the evolutionary emergence of this sort of pandemic. And to sort of break down how you might do that in a simple way, you just sort of construct a model where there's some animal reservoir like bats, and there's occasionally spillover of coronaviruses or maybe it's flu viruses or whatever it might be into humans. Now they're not typically well adapted at that stage. So the human might you know, spread it a little bit within the human population, but ultimately this chain of transmission would die out unless there's some kind of evolutionary adaptation that happens to the human population. And so there's this sort of branching process that occurs. Every time we get a, a spillover into humans, there are these sort of stuttering chains of transmission that ultimately die out. But within any infection, there are mutations appearing and occasionally maybe a mutation happens that allows it to be very well adapted to humans, like those six mutations that are necessary uh, in the case of the current coronavirus. And once those appear, then it can become sort of a, an explosive spread within the human population because it's now possible for it to spread from human to human very efficiently. And so there's sort of this subcritical process that you might call it early on where it's ultimately destined to die out unless the appropriate mutations happen and then it becomes super critical. And then it spreads essentially exponentially at least in the early stages throughout the human population. And so in other words, every infected individual produces a constant number of new infections and that number is, is greater than one in the initial stages at least. Uh, I'll just show you some data uh, from the Canadian context for how things are in the, uh, currently in terms of the spread of coronavirus. So I'll just say a bit about this graph because you'll see a number of websites, this is one of them you can find, uh, that, that present this sort of data and you can play around with it in different ways. So on the horizontal axis here is, is time, essentially time. I say essentially time because each one of these curves is a different province and they've kind of been translated horizontally so that they all line up. And the idea is that because the outbreak in BC typically isn't going to have started at the same time as the outbreak in Ontario, we line all the curves up so that they start at the same point in time here and that allows us to more easily compare the trajectories of the different provinces. Uh, on the vertical axis, the important thing to note is it's a log scale. So in other words, every time I go up a unit here, I get 10 there and I go up the same unit, I go up in multiples of 10. There's 100, there's 1,000, there's 10,000. And the reason for using a log scale is because if it's growing exponentially, then on a log scale, these, line, these curves should be straight lines. And so if you look at the Ontario trajectory, which is this one here, for example, you can see early on in the outbreak, it very, very nicely lied along this straight line showing perfect exponential growth. Uh, with a doubling time of about four days, meaning the number of active cases doubled every four days in those early stages. And then of course, things got scrunched down. The, the, the curve was flattened and things started to level out for reasons having to do with various social distancing measures. Um, 
So once things are spreading like this in the population, we can also model that. And the reason to do that is to make predictions about where things are going and to try and understand how best to control things. And so here's another set of data a little closer to home. So this is data from the Kingston Frontenac Lennox Eddington Public Health Unit. Uh, this is the number of active cases in that public health unit over time. So you can see we've been pretty fortunate in that there's been a relatively small number of cases and there's it's tailed off to basically zero in this particular public health unit. And we might be interested in trying to model this, this epidemic curve. And there are broadly speaking two ways you might try and do that. One of them is what you'd call a statistical model, maybe, where you just choose some functional form that you think is a good description of what the data ought to look like. So you might expect outbreaks are going to go up and they're going to come down. So I'm going to use some sort of bell-shaped curve, and that's all I'm going to assume. So here's a, an example where I've chosen this sort of normal bell-shaped curve as a possibility. And then you just choose the parameters of that function to best fit this curve. And the idea is if I had done that early on over here, I could then use the curve to kind of extrapolate out what I might expect to happen over time. But there's no underlying mechanism generating the shape of that curve. I've just made an assumption about what the curve shape is, and then I've fit it to the data. And that's what you'd call a statistical model. Uh, the other very common kind of model that's used a lot right now is what you call a mechanistic model, where you're actually building a model for the transmission among individuals in the population. So I'll actually model an individual that's infected, it contacts others and transmit the disease to those and so on. And I keep track of what's going on at this level, modeling it mechanistically. And so again, here's an example of exponential growth where each infection generates two new ones. Mathematically, that's what we're, we have in a simple model down here. We've got the rate of change of the number of infected individuals is just the births of new infection. Each infected individual is generating new ones at a rate B. And then the loss of infections because individuals are either recovering or dying. And you probably have heard of this R naught quantity, this reproduction number in various places in the news. That's just the ratio of the birth rate to the loss rate. Uh, and if that's bigger than one, the outbreak is growing. If that's less than one, then the outbreak is declining. This is just a measure of the expected number of new infections each, new, each uh, infection generates. Uh, and there's a curve that comes from a model like that where initially there's exponential growth, but then in order to have this match the data, I've assumed that this birth rate tails off as a result of things like social distancing, for example, lockdowns and that kind of thing that result in the birth rate declining to a point where the epidemic ultimately dies out. Now, you might also ask, ask you know, if we hadn't intervened, if we hadn't used some kind of uh, lockdowns or social distancing, what would happen? And so, again, it's going to start with exponential growth initially. And here's my simple mathematical model for that. But ultimately, exponential growth can't go on forever in terms of the number of infections. And one of the main reasons that that's not going to happen is because eventually the number of susceptible people in the population is going to be reduced to a very low number, assuming that immunity is achieved once you recover from infection. So as more and more individuals are infected, you'll have fewer and fewer susceptible individuals. And so this birth rate should go down naturally because there are fewer and fewer susceptible individuals in the population. And so one way to model that is to actually treat that birth rate here as a function of the number of susceptibles. So the birth rate is big when the susceptible population is big and it's small when the susceptible population is small. And when you do that, then you have an outbreak that's naturally self-limiting through what's called herd immunity. And I'll just briefly explain what that is because some countries initially were thinking of this as a way to try and uh, ultimately let the outbreak run its course and, and see what happened. And so again, we can define R0, it's just the birth rate over the death rate, but now the birth rate depends on the number of susceptible individuals in the population. And because that's changing in time, we have to say what time we're talking about. And so R0 is defined for the time when the susceptible population is completely susceptible. There are no infected individuals. And then as time goes by, the number of susceptibles decreases. And so this reproduction number decreases as well. Remember this reproduction number is the number of new infections caused by every infection. And so once that hits one, each infection is just replacing itself. And as it decreases below one, that's when the outbreak starts to die off. And so if we look at a plot of what happens over time, because the susceptible population is dying off, this effective reproduction number, as it's called, is getting smaller and smaller until eventually it crosses one at this time T star. And that's the point in time when we'd say herd immunity is reached. Herd immunity is reached in the sense that uh, the number of susceptible hosts in the population has re been reduced to such a low value 
that the infection can no longer sustain itself. There, there are too few susceptible individuals in the population for the infection to continue in the to continue spreading. And then as things progress further, the effective reproduction number goes below one even. And if we look at what that means in terms of a plot of the number of active infections as a function of time, which is the second graph here, it's going up over time when the reproduction number is bigger than one. Each infection is generating more than one new infection. At this magical point of herd immunity, it is exactly balanced. They're just replacing themselves, these infections. And then beyond that point of herd immunity, each infection is not even replacing itself anymore. And so the epidemic dies out, resulting in this, again, this sort of unimodal peak-shaped outbreak, but in this case, due to herd immunity. Now, uh, <clears throat> of course, what happens in reality is, is gonna be a combination of, of the two things I just talked about. So we're introducing various kinds of control measures and that should result in some kind of slowdown of the spread. And ultimately, if we hadn't done that, herd immunity would also result in some kind of slowdown of the spread. And so what we wanna to do to try and understand the interplay between those two things is to build a model that has both of those in. And that's just, just uh, what, a, what we're, one of the things we're doing in this modeling table for the province is constructing <clears throat> models that have those different elements in them. And so the models, some of the models we're looking at are very much like the one I just described where we keep track of the number of susceptible individuals, the number of infectious and the number of recovered and they're called SIR models for that reason. But they're slightly more complicated in that you take that infectious class and you divide it up into a bunch of different kinds of infected individuals. There might be individuals that are infected but not yet symptomatic and not yet able to spread the virus. Then there are individuals that are not yet symptomatic, but they are able to spread the virus. And then there are individuals that are spreading and symptomatic. There are individuals who are hospitalized. There are individuals who are hospitalized and in the ICU. And you can imagine structuring this by age classes, structuring it geographically, making it as complicated as you like. So it's all based on this sort of simple underlying idea of these different compartments, but the model can be developed to to account for the sorts of important structures that are relevant for the disease in question. And in this case, these are the very least sorts of things you'd wanna keep track of for COVID-19, because we know that all five of those particular sub bins are important. And I'll just finish by showing you an example of some both simulation results from a model like this and some data. Again, this is data from Ontario in this case. Uh, each of these plots, these are numbers, sorry, numbers on the horizontal axes and time on the, sorry, on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis in days. Uh, all of these different colored lines are individual realizations of a stochastic model that has the same parameters. So every time you run the model, by chance, you know, an individual didn't go to the grocery store that day and things are a little bit different. So you run the model over and over again and you get slightly different realizations. The solid black curves on all of these plots are the actual Ontario data. It's not quite up to date, but this is probably accurate to maybe a, a week ago now at this point. This is the cumulative number of cases. This is the cumulative number of deaths in Ontario. Incidence is just the number of new cases reported on any given day. So that's why that jumps around quite a lot. And active cases is the number of cases that are currently active. So they're, they're still infected, they haven't recovered or they haven't died on that particular day. And then there's hospitalizations and ICUs. And I'll just point out one interesting thing to notice on these graphs in this particular one here is everything sort of looked like we had it under control in Ontario. And then there was this strange little blip here that went up. And if you look at what's happened since then over the last week, it's coming back down again. Uh, and you can see that in the incidence curve here, there's this sort of anomalous increase in the number of infections that happened on each one of those days over that period of time. It's not completely clear what caused that, but if you track back in time what happened just before this, it corresponds with Mother's Day weekend. So there's some thinking that maybe people change their behavior uh, significantly enough on Mother's Day in order to visit family and that sort of thing, that that resulted in a in this slight uptick in the number of infections before it's starting to go back down again. But uh, it's not entirely clear if that's, if that's the whole story or what, but it's interesting that it does coincide with that particular event. So I'm just gonna leave it there. There's lots of things we could talk about, but I'm happy to take any questions. I'll just have this slide up here for a few acknowledgements and maybe open it up. Fantastic, Troy. I, this is the one part of doing it like online is, is we can't hear the applaud or whatnot, but I really wanna thank you for this fantastic talk. And we did have a couple of questions come in through our different um, 
medium. So I'm hoping you can take some. Um, one of the things when you when you plotted that really interesting like list of all the different types of viruses, they all seem to have like very varied names. Some of them had the same name, like SARS appeared multiple times. Where does yeah. I think this question came from uh, Nick? Uh, where do the viruses kind of get their names? Like why why does one name stick over another? Yeah, I don't have a clear answer to that myself. So I mean, there are naming conventions for these things, but they're also named in terms of where they were found geographically sometimes. Uh, and so you'll notice that the, the two that are sort of most relevant to humans, uh, well, the three, I guess, is SARS-CoV, that was the 2000, 2003 one. And then this is, again, SARS-CoV, and it's just number two now. So there's sort of an obvious naming convention for that one. <laughs> Why MERS didn't get that same designation, I'm not sure, maybe because it was more distantly related in the tree, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's it's an interesting question. And it also has to do with where they're found, I think. So I'm not sure if this might be Hong Kong, for example. I know influenza viruses are often labeled that way. Very interesting. Uh, there was a question, um, what has it been like working with the Ontario modeling consensus tables? You make these models, but you're, you're part of this group that's using them? Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's been eye opening, I guess I would say. So I, I haven't really done much along that sort of line before. I've been, you know, I was mostly stuck to the ivory tower in some sense. Uh, and it's been interesting to see, I mean, basically what the, the, the group of people in charge of what's happening has a bunch of sub panels of all different kinds. And each of those sub panels, us being one of them, does what they do and they feed information up the chain. And then someone further up the chain has to integrate all of the information that comes in and make decisions on policy and that sort of thing. And so it's been pretty interesting to see how all of that works, I guess. And the chain of events that has to happen from you know an idea to going all the way through this chain to then disappearing if it wasn't a good idea and that sort of thing. Uh, I have to say, I, I've been quite impressed with the people I've interacted with for the most part though, in terms of their, uh, how hard they're working to try and deal with the problem and how open they are to any sorts of evidence and data that you might have that would speak to ways to try and control things. So there's a question from YouTube from Rob Noble. There are lots of amateur epidemiologists these days <laughs> online. Everyone seems to have their own simple numerical models. Is there value in that kind of activity? So that's a great question. And I've noticed that in this particular outbreak. So I was involved in some modeling in the 2003 outbreak for SARS as well. And it's quite a, a difference between now and then. In 2003, you know, it was almost like you had to, it was hard to get someone to listen to you if you were doing a model. And now everybody's doing a model and models are all over the place. And so at, at some level, I think that's great because uh, you know, the greater the diversity of ideas that people put forward, the, the greater the likelihood that we're gonna come across something that actually works. Uh, the downside of it, of course, is it's sometimes, unless you really know what's going on, it's hard to separate the stuff that is good from the stuff that is a little bit uh, questionable, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but it is interesting that everybody has sort of jumped on this to do things. Everybody wants to somehow play a role, right? And, you know, and help contribute in various ways. And I think that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Connor Stone. Many of the viruses that are listed here, uh, they seem to have bat in front of them. And you, you did talk for a little bit about bats and bat viruses. What's special about bats? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I wish I did, but it does seem to be an important reservoir uh, for viruses that go across species, uh, uh, particularly coronaviruses. And I don't know what it is about bats. I'm sure somebody does. It's probably something physiological, which I don't know anything about, that, that is important in them being able to have viruses that are uh, close enough in some sense to be able to infect humans to just get a foothold in and then go through some sort of evolutionary adaptation once they're in the human population. Uh, mm -hmm. In other viruses, it's, it's other things. So for flu, you know, it can be birds, for example, pigs are thought to be important as you know, the, uh, the swine flu pandemic that happened. So I think it's a combination of how close the things like receptors are between us and whatever other host we're talking about, but also 
you know, depending on the virus, I mean, how, how promiscuous it is in some sense uh, is, is often how people refer to these things. How wide of a host range did these things have? And, and uh, I don't really know why it is that some species are more prone to be sources of spillovers than others. So we are about to do our first round of trivia. I want to do one last question for you that I see from the audience. We have a number of extra ones. So I wanted to highlight that all of our speakers today will be sticking around to the very end to take more questions and allow more discussion. I'm sorry that we don't have time to just take them all at one time. We want to get everybody kind of on the stage and then we'll have more people talking. Uh, if you want to join us for trivia in the description, uh, it was recently added, so you may need to refresh the page. Uh, there's a link to a form where you'll be able to enter your uh, trivia answers. But last question for you, Troy, uh, from Barbara Jonkor. How do you disentangle the effect of social distancing versus uh, herd immunity or mass immunity? If mass immunity is, is uh, sorry, mass, if mass is, mass immunity is like kind of contaminating that number, if it's occurring prior to social distancing measures, maybe that, is it hard to tell the difference? Yeah, so that's a great question too. I mean, I think the easiest way is, it's based on some assumptions, but if you know what R naught is, so if for something like COVID-19 before, as it was starting to spread really right now, it's somewhere between two and a half and three. So that means each infection generates about two and a half to three new infections on average. And you can take that number and, and ask what fraction of the population would therefore need to be infected in order for that to be one. And so it's basically the reciprocal of that. And so you can get an estimate of the fraction of the population that you need to have already been infected for herd immunity. And that's on the order of you know, 60%. And so basically with that ballpark calculation, we can tell that unless there's a lot of infection going on under the surface that is asymptomatic and we don't know about, we're nowhere near a point where any element of herd immunity would be important at this stage. Well, thanks again. Like I said, you will thank you for sticking around longer for coming back at the end. Sure thing. There, there are a couple more questions that were for you, and I'm looking forward to getting to those uh, a little bit later in the night. So uh, at this point, I wanted to share my screen and start the first round of trivia. So let's see. Is it? Yeah. So at the bottom, there should be a link to this. There's a bit.ly link called Sci Untap Trivia. So if you open that up, we do have a, a few questions at the top, including your email. That's because we plan to uh, reach out to you after the event. Um, we can, uh, we're planning on sending maybe some swag from our institute to a random person that submits plus a random person that has the highest score. Um, I do hope that you're all going to play honestly at home don't go looking up some of these answers, but I hope you get to enjoy this. And we'll just do this, um, I'll go through every, I'm gonna have five questions, I'm gonna go through each of them twice, and then we're gonna come on and move on to our next speaker. So, round one. With industrialization reduced, and we've seen like the air quality getting better in some areas, um, so the industrialization reduced during this time, greenhouse gas emissions dropped compared to the same period last year and before the COVID era. The question to you is what this drop peaked in April? What was that percentage drop? Did it drop by 50%, drop by 10%? We have a little bit of a range that we'll accept, but what do you think it is? And again, I'll read each of these questions twice. Question two, what two other recent viruses were also coronaviruses? And I think Troy may have, might have spoiled this, but that means if you're paying attention, you get a freebie. So what two other recent viruses were also coronaviruses? And we want both of them. What is the term for a quickly spreading contagious disease affecting a large geographic region? That's question number three. Question four, what is the official name of this virus, the COVID virus, as designated by the World Health Organization? And, 
I'm getting some compliments. <laughs> Last but not least, question from this round was a semi picture round. In what year did Max Dilbrook, Alfred D. Hershey, and Salvador E. Luria, pictured here, receive the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine? specifically for their discoveries concerning the replication mechanism and the genetic structures of viruses. What year did that happen? Okay, I'm gonna do one quick reading of them again, in case you missed any, because we have strategically not placed them in the form. So question one, with industrialization reduced during this time, greenhouse gas emissions dropped compared to the same period before the COVID-19 period. This drop, this drop peaked in April. What was the percentage drop? What two other recent viruses were also coronavirus? Question three, what is the term for a quickly spreading contagious disease affecting a large geographic region? Question four, what is the official name of the virus as designated by the World Health Organization? And the last question from this round, question five, in what year did Max Delbrook, Alfred D. Hershey, and Salvador E. Luria, pictured here, receive the Nobel Prize in Physiology and or Medicine, specifically for their discoveries concerning the replication mechanisms and the genetic structures of viruses? So put those in and then just stay tuned on that Form. Um, the next five questions will be given after our next speaker. Um, and so I think it's maybe time for our next speaker. So could our next speaker reveal himself? <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Hi, Tommy. And yeah, it's hard to have a ta-da with a 20-second delay. <laughs> Depends on what you're watching. <laughs> So our next speaker is Tony Noble. Tony, you're a professor in physics at Queen's University and the scientific director of the McDonald Institute. And your research brings people together to understand the nature of the smallest particles in the universe. And that includes trying to uncover maybe what's the nature of dark matter. Tonight, you're talking with us about something quite different as you're a member of the MVM team and you're focusing in that team as part of its design and testing. And so your talk today, I'm really looking forward to hearing about this because it's gotten a little bit of buzz in the news and I want to understand a little bit more about it, is the mechanical ventilator Milano. So take it away. Okay, uh, let me figure out which one of these, probably this one. Are people able to see that screen in full screen? Okay. Yes, we can. <laughs> I, I get a thumbs up, good. It's very difficult actually speaking to a blank screen and knowing, not knowing actually whether there's anybody out there listening, although I, I did hear a couple names I recognize, so good for them. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about, it's not really a, a science talk, it, it's about how a group of scientists, in, in this case astroparticle physicists, uh, mainly initially, and engineers came together uh, to build a, a ventilator in response to the situation we found ourselves in with the COVID-19 pandemic. And when I say a team, I, I really do mean a team. This is, uh, not doing anything, why not? This, this is uh, an early paper that was published by us, and I'll, I'll go into in a, in a minute why we did that. But uh, this I counted as 151 people who signed the paper that was released after uh, the first two weeks, basically, of, of working on a design. Uh, it represents 58 different institutions across Italy and Canada uh, and other countries. And uh, it, uh, it has grown significantly since then in terms of the number of people who have offered their assistance and joined in. And in particular, it includes a lot of people who are from our national labs, who are from uh, government agencies, and it includes people who are in the uh, medical uh, fields who have been advising us. So I just wanted to start with acknowledgement of the, the fact that there really are a significant number of people involved. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few things. One, sort of just the origins, how, how this got started. Um, I'll spend most of my time because that's where my effort has been in, in terms of how the ventilator works. Uh, 
Uh, but just to give some perspective uh, on what the challenges were and uh, what the next steps are as we go forward with this project. So in terms of how it got started, of course, um, well, we know it, this project itself got started because of the situation in, in Italy. And, and this is one of the towns that was heavily infected. And um, I, I just want to say a little bit about, you know, how the community responded to various calls, international calls, to try and help with the shortage that was identified in terms of uh, ventilators. This is, uh, there, there are many, many studies. This is one that I picked out, uh, which we're looking at the potential impact of the coronavirus. This is a typical example. And here, uh, you know, the major challenge was that there was this global shortage of mechanical ventilators, uh, which provide life-saving uh, assistance for patients with, with moderate to severe COVID-19. And uh, the idea was, uh, you know, the, the, the recommendations from this particular study were that uh, we needed to be able to produce uh, more ventilators, and in particular in a couple of classes. And those classes were uh, low-capacity, low-cost ventilators for, for people uh, with short-term respiratory support requirements and so on or more robust, uh, sort of high capacity, moderate cost ventilators for people who had much more severe uh, lung injuries. And uh, they asked the community to find ways to engage the private sector firms in this enterprise to find interesting, innovative solutions that would be possible to uh, you know, mobilize large parts of the community to work together to find solutions. And so that's, uh, that's kind of where we started uh, recognizing this call. Uh, in Milano, in the early days of the COVID, we all saw the, the horrific uh, images of the devastating impact that was happening there, mostly in the Lombardy region in the north of Italy. And it turns out that one of our colleagues uh, Cristiano Galbiati, who's a person I have worked with uh, uh, as a scientist. He's the leader of a, what has come to be this sort of global argon dark matter program, which contains hundreds of astroparticle physicists. Uh, and he's leading that enterprise. The goal of that, of course, is to search for dark matter. But he was in lockdown in Milano and seeing everything happening around him in this extremely hard hit area. And so he recognized that there was this desperate need to do something and recognized that we had the technology and the engineering skills and the project management skills. Uh, we didn't know anything about medicine, of course. So he quickly reached out to an international team of physicists and engineers, these people that he was already working with. And uh, in particular, as in regards to Canada, he reached out to Art MacDonald, who most people I think know from Queens, was the Nobel laureate in 2015, and part of this team. And that led to a rather rapid expansion in Canada because uh, what Art was able to do was to get all of the, uh, all, get a significant number of uh, large uh, national laboratories in Canada. So the uh, Canadian nuclear labs in Chalk River, uh, Triumph in Vancouver, Snow Lab in Sudbury, and the McDonald Institute here at Queen's, and get the uh, management and resources of those labs to, to back this project. And uh, that worked well in the sense that we knew how to design things. We had strong technical expertise. We had large collaborations. We were used to collaborating internationally and uh, how to organize a project. Of course, we, we didn't know anything about medicine and wouldn't claim to. And so the effort was ultimately only successful by developing the partnership with the healthcare providers, uh, with people who are experts in how to actually manufacture things on a large scale, and people who know how to get these things through um, the regulatory bodies in, in the appropriate way and to get the support of, of government. And it was by having the connection into the laboratories and this large community that worked in that way already that, that allowed us to advance uh, quickly. So let me talk a little bit about how ventilators work. 
Um, so this is the uh, sort of drawing, if you like, uh, of, of the ventilators as it was designed. A small unit that would be in a hospital ICU, for example, attached to a patient. None of the hoses are shown here. And what we had conceived was we needed something that we could build quickly, which meant we needed something that could be built out of uh, readily available parts that would not be too expensive, uh, that would be well controlled so that uh, the ventilator itself should not be subject to uh, failures and so on uh, to complicate the issue. And so we wanted it to be very robust and basically very simple. The fewer moving parts, the better. And the idea uh, of how these things work is, is rather simple. You have some oxygen that you want to push into the lungs. And I have a hokey little animation here. It says, you know, this valve opens, the oxygenated air comes into the lungs, it closes, and the exhaust valve uh, allows the uh, now depleted uh, air to go out. And so that, that's pretty simple. Of course, uh, ultimately, it gets a lot more difficult. Um, what you first have to do is to be able to have exquisite control of those valves to be able to open and close them in a way that the pressure and flow have exactly the right profile to do the best you can for the patient. And to do that, you need to be able to measure the pressure at a number of different sites uh, as input. So you're controlling on the pressure in our case. Uh, you need to monitor the flow so you know that it's behaving properly. You need to measure the oxygen so you know what you're delivering. There's a lot of risk uh, of overpressure or underpressure doing damage, so you need to build in mechanisms that allow the thing to uh, fail in a way that the pressures don't build up in the lungs and so on, so we have uh, pressure relief systems. Um, you, we worry a lot about the computer side of things, this controller, uh, if anyone's ever had a Microsoft product, they do occasionally hang and uh, you, know, they, you, you, you worry about those. So we built in the completely redundant, if you like, independent CPU, which is monitoring things and monitoring the main computer and can take over and put it into a well-established uh, state if something has gone wrong and of course, if, if it sees that, you want to be uh, raising alarms, uh, both to uh, locally where the, the clinicians are with the patient, but also at hospital uh, nursing stations and so on, so that they're aware that something has gone wrong. And it has the ability to try and restart the machine and all those things. So, so that's the idea. If you, uh, a slightly more elaborate cartoon uh, than I could do in PowerPoint is this one, but it shows uh, you know, that the box is the cyan area where all the, the guts of the machine are. The patient is outside and there's tubes that run from the machine to the patient that provide the oxygen, allow them to breathe and so on. One feature I didn't mention was this PEEP valve, uh, which is required. It turns out for <clears throat> health reasons, you want to keep at least some positive pressure in the lungs to keep uh, parts of the lungs inflated so that uh, you can enhance the ability to oxygenate. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. So that's the basic structure. Uh, we went through a design evolution, uh, not too dissimilar from, uh, from what you see there. And I'm sad to report that I've seen <laughs> and used all of those devices in, in my time. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, we had to think about the medical. And as I said, we're not physicists. And as uh, Janet McDonald is commonly heard to say, we're not real doctors and, and make sure we remember that. And it is actually important that we, we received enormous guidance from people who are experts in this field, medical ventilator experts, the designers, the doctors on the floor, respiratory therapists who are dealing with the patients on, on, a, on a daily basis, the people, the, the nurses, the trainers who are, are using the instrumentation. It has to uh, work well. It has to be something that they feel familiar with and not awkward. And so we wanted to make sure that our design looked and felt like a typical ventilator. And getting all that input was, was absolutely critical. With, again, so that we could provide a proper uh, patient care with something that was easy to use, easy to learn, and felt familiar to the people who would be using it. Uh, we are also not specialists in how you take a design idea and normally we build one of things uh, in terms of detectors. Now you want to build uh, 10,000 of these and so getting uh, manufacturers involved at the early stages. And so we're really lucky that we're able to uh, make connections with Elemaster in Italy 
who has sister companies in the U.S. Uh, and Canada. In Canada, it's uh, Vexels, who has partnership with Elemaster, and they've coupled with JMP Solutions. One of them will do more the electrical and control part, and one more the body. But uh, they've been absolutely essential you know, to have on board. Technically, the part we can do is we have hundreds of physicists and engineers where we have a lot of experience at writing software, building things, electrical devices, instrumentation, handling fluidics. Uh, we're good at project management, quality assurance, quality control. All of those things are, are essential features in what we do, uh, but not applied to this kind of technology. And then uh, in order for these devices to be used, you have to be able to demonstrate that they meet all the appropriate standards uh, for care. And um, there have been uh, as much development in these during the pandemic uh, as in the development of the uh, design itself in the sense that different agencies have been trying to get things to market and develop uh, standards for emergency use that will allow things to move a lot quicker. And so we've been working with the Food and Drug Administration in the US and with Health Canada, of course. Uh, the United, United Kingdom had a very nice, well-developed set of guidelines on how to, uh, what would be appropriate for rapid manufacturing. And I think I've read approximately a billion of these uh, standards over, over the last couple of weeks as we try to uh, make sure that uh, we are uh, doing everything in a, in a very professional way. Um, so what does it do? Uh, we basically have two modes in Canada that we will be operating. One is called pressure control. And that means the machine is completely in control. The patient is probably unconscious. They're not able to breathe on their own. So the machine is doing all the work. And in this case, uh, you know, a new breath starts at the end of the previous, and it's just a very repetitious uh, cycle. We apply pressure, uh, we allow that pressure to fade away on the exhaust phase and so on. Of course, you can have uh, uh, very different settings on how much pressure you apply, how fast you need to breathe, depends on the patient size, all kinds of different things. So you have to be able to control all those things. Um, you have to also be able to deal with sort of odd things that come out. It turns out, as you know, everybody sighs from time to time. People have to cough. Uh, you have to build those in so that those happen on a regular basis or can happen. Uh, the patient may start to try breathing themselves, and you don't want to be forcing air down their throat when they're trying to breathe. And so you have to be able to recognize this weak uh, patient. And so you can see on the top pulse, uh, there's a uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in this area, the, the, the pulse suddenly dropped a bit. That was a patient trying to take a breath, breathing in slightly, creating a little bit of a low pressure. And the machine has to identify that and say, oh, the patient is trying to breathe. I'll provide it with a breath. I'll assist it. And so uh, the machine is, is designed to do that. The other thing I mentioned earlier, these PEEP valves, uh, it turns out that uh, what you want is a slight positive pressure. So you see our pressure never drops down completely to zero. It stays slightly positive at all times. And it turns out that that's to ensure that the alveoli in the lungs don't collapse. So the alveoli, I put a little picture here. I'm obviously not a biologist, but these are our little sacs that are responsible for the exchange of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide at the end of the uh, lungs. One of the things I noticed early on is uh, dealing with uh, a largely Italian group. You have to make sure that you don't get mixed up between the alveoli and the ravioli, which are uh, little sacs also, but in this case for, for nutrition. I can't hear everybody laughing. That's, that's too bad. Okay, so, so that's um, one of the pressure control ventilation. Uh, that's one of the modes that we deal with. The other one is um, pressure support ventilation. And these are the only two modes actually that are allowed in, in Canada, uh, to my knowledge, at least in terms of when you're controlling with pressure. And in pressure support, you have a patient who is able to breathe, but they're very, very sick. They're not able to breathe well. And so you are providing assistance. And so at the very beginning of this pulse, uh, they, take, they, they start to draw in. You see a little weak pulse there, a drop in pressure. And so you assist by providing some, some oxygen. And then you wait till they ask for it again. 
And so uh, there's a regular pattern as long as the patient is demanding a breath and we're supporting them. It's also very important that people who have been on ventilators for too long are, have kind of forgotten how to breathe. And uh, as they start to recover, you have to wean them off the ventilators uh, by putting them into this mode, allowing them to try, assisting them at first, and then as they get stronger and stronger, you can change the threshold. And so that uh, impacts uh, uh, you know, how hard they have to work to, to learn to breathe again. But of course, uh, you have to be able to recognize, for example, if they stop breathing, that's, that's a bad thing. And so the machine has to be monitoring that there's a length of time. And if the patient doesn't ask for a breath in that, late, at that length of time, then you switch back to controlling completely and you raise an alarm and, uh, and you try and get things back on track again. Okay, so um, this is a typical plot from one of our devices. This is one that we used uh, to demonstrate for the Food and Drug Administration when we got certification there. What you see and what the lungs want is they want a very high flow at the beginning and then that has to taper off. So you have to design it in a way that you get this peak uh, appearing at the beginning. To do that, you have to generate a quite a peak in pressure as well at the beginning, of course, to get the flow, but you don't want that, uh, that actually to migrate into the lungs. You don't want to shock the lungs. So you have to build in some dampening, if you like, by through the circuitry and so on. So the pressure at the lungs is a much more gradual effect. So we have this gentle pressure rise after this initial spike. But for COVID-19, what you want apparently, uh, what we're advised and medical guys is that you want this high flow at the beginning. And so that's how we've uh, designed it. And these tests are done using an artificial lung, a, a simulator that looks exactly like, uh, well, behaves exactly like a human lung, but for which we can measure all the properties of the flow and the pressure and so on and compare them with our device. So this has device information, but also our simulator on there. And so it's, it's actually working rather well. Uh, the challenges, uh, this wasn't easy, uh, uh, and I would just want to say a few words about why it wasn't easy. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to recognize that all across Canada, there were so many people who responded to the requests for people to support um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic in whatever way they could. The people were sewing masks. People were building PPE uh, devices to, to clean them. People were... Um, in their warehouses, building their own uh, ventilators, trying to solve this problem. And of course, um, in there is, you know, there, there are a number that will, will be successful. And, uh, you know, how is it that we, we were able to, to, to be successful? And I think, you know, being successful meant we were able to capture the attention of the top medical experts who were probably being called 20 times a day ask, asking, uh, being asked for advice. Uh, likewise, the government would be asking and being asked for advice all the time. Uh, manufacturers were being bombarded with, uh, you know, could you do this? Could you do that? Suppliers, likewise. And so somehow um, we had to uh, navigate that and, and be recognized in terms of establishing some uh, the credibility of this team. And I think what was advantageous for us was that we were already a very large international uh, project. Um, that had had very, uh, a number of world leading successes that were recognized. And so in some sense, we had household name uh, recognition. Uh, but very importantly was that the national laboratories all across Canada and in the United States and Italy, and I've only named a few of them here, got behind this. Uh, they knew the capabilities of their laboratories. They recognized this was an initiative that they could support and so we got a huge support from the labs. And of course, the national lab directors and scientists are already well recognized uh, with the government and so on. And so it naturally led uh, us to be able to advance our ideas and have good discussions uh, that allowed us to ultimately to advance. Um, medical devices uh, actually have very complex standards that need to be met. And um, we basically rely on the manufacturing companies to, to negotiate and navigate that particular part. How do we get the ISO certification? What are all the tests going to be? How do you build these things uh, in a way that will meet the code? Uh, and the, the, these 
the companies that we are working with have ISO certification already in terms of manufacturing protocols. So that was critical. It's also very difficult to find parts because as you can imagine, every country has similar initiatives and the number of components out there are, are finite. And so uh, again, the manufacturing teams have uh, procurement teams that took the lead on that, trying to find supplies and being able to uh, say there was already government backing at some level encouragement and so on was critical to be able to catch the ear of, uh, of suppliers so that they knew this was uh, something that they really should pay attention to because there was a, a reasonable likelihood of success. And I think one of the other challenges is that as physicists, we had to pivot the way we do things, the way we design. I mean, we, we, we do a lot of software development and electronics and stuff, but uh, it's not normally done according to such exacting standards in the, way, in the way you behave and document and things. You know, we build it, test it, tweak it, fiddle it, and so on. Uh, but none of that works in this kind of environment. So we did have to, uh, again, learn from experts on how to do things in a way that we would be uh, meeting those, uh, those standards along the way. Uh, so, we, so we did. And these are some of the milestones and successes. And, uh, and as I mentioned, some of the advantages, perhaps. Uh, the project was only initiated in, in late March. And uh, so far, we've built three different series of prototypes, as we've learned one from the other. Already in May 2nd, based on those prototypes, we were able to get FDA approval in the US. And this is uh, for emergency use. Uh, not, and all of that happened in six weeks, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and on May 26th, just uh, less than, well, about a week ago now, uh, we got a contract signed between the, the, the Vexos and the government of Canada in terms of the contract to build 10,000 uh, ventilators. So one of our advantages is uh, we actually have people all the way from the west coast of Canada to, to Italy and, uh, and uh, Eastern Europe. And so we span nine different time zones. So nothing ever stopped. When there was a problem, there was somebody somewhere in the world able to work on it. And so we were active 24 hours a day. I think I was on Zoom practically 24 hours a day. And, but this is an advantage of a well-connected international collaboration that was already set up with all the email distribution lists normally communicating in this way. And the fact that we could work across all these time zones allowed for very rapid development. We also made, uh, made it quite clear that the uh, design was gonna be public. Uh, we wanted to make sure anybody who wanted to use our design could copy it and use it. So we, we have been publishing everything, uh, made it open source. It's licensed through something that's called an open hardware license at CERN, which allows people to pick up that license and uh, build according to uh, the design that we provide there. Um, we were worried about you know people trying to raise a patent on something and, and block the ability to do things. And we do want it to be available. So I think the successes that we've had so far, and we're not out to the woods yet, uh, demonstrate you know, the ability of our community and major laboratories to, to work together to you know, rapidly address matters of global urgency and, and doing that in a very cross-disciplinary fashion where we worked with our industrial partners, government agencies, and, and of course the medical uh, uh, clinicians. The other thing I wanted to acknowledge was that the outpouring of support was enormous, uh, not just in terms of money, and we did get a lot of charitable donations for money, which was incredibly uh, important for us to be able to seed the project. As, as we, you're trying to develop things, but you have no money initially with no contract. And so having seed money through these donations was critical, but also just the donations and offers for donation for time. Uh, people all across uh, Canada calling up and saying, this, this sounds interesting, what can I do to help? And so, so that was fantastic. Um, so in terms of uh, next steps, I've, I've kind of sort of said where we are. Um, you know, we're, we're now at the point where we have prototypes at work. We have, uh, a, our first step was to try and achieve uh, through the US, the, the FDA certification, we achieved that. That allowed us to take the next steps, which were to uh, develop uh, the devices as they would look in Canada and move towards Health Canada approval. Uh, so as we speak, the companies in Canada, Vexels and JMP are ramping up for production. They've been purchasing like mad all the components. They've been doing dry fits. Uh, they have objects that are starting to look like real uh, ventilators. And uh, we're hoping 
uh, well, we're working towards a Health Canada approval by mid-June and Health Canada have been absolutely fantastic in providing support in terms of what they, what they need to see in order to uh, make those adjudications. Uh, so next week we have uh, plans to do hundreds, literally hundreds, probably about 600 altogether of tests on the devices that will be used as part of that package. Uh, using qualification builds. And the goal by midsummer is that we're producing roughly a thousand of these per, per week in Canada. So I just want to end by saying that, you know, uh, for, for those of you who, who like to visit Italy, you'll recognize the iconic Spanish steps here. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the end of this pandemic, the end of our social distancing and the return of the Spanish steps as you see them here to I think what people are more used to seeing, which is, which is this. And so I'm gonna stop there, Mark, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Tony. I do miss the Spanish, I miss being able to travel. I miss being able to see people, um, but this is, this is really, really important work. And so I, I really appreciate you sharing it with us today. And we do have a number of questions. Um, so, First question, I think, is from Norm Milbury, uh, who earlier said he's from St. John's, Newfoundland. He's curious if you have any commentary on, on the priorities going forward to ensure that our, our, basically, our healthcare system is prepared with the equipment we need for future pandemics. Well, I, I, of course, don't know all the steps that are being taken. We, we have some insight to that. I think um, Health Canada, or well, the Government of Canada have engaged a number of companies. We are one of them in terms of ventilators. I believe there are four companies altogether that they're at some stage of discussions with and some other contracts have been launched. So I think they are fairly comfortable that in terms of ventilators, they will be well positioned. And the mandate for us of producing a thousand per week is in case there is a second wave where right now we feel fairly comfortable, but we don't know what's coming. But of course, that's only one element. And I, and I know that there's an awful lot of work going on in terms of other things like uh, PPE and so on. And ventilators are not the answer to everything. They are, are one particular tool. And so I do know, I don't know uh, how well Canada will be prepared, but I do know that we hear an awful lot of effort going in uh, to those other areas as well. Um, and I think um, the overhaul of our uh, health care as it applies to uh, our, our most vulnerable citizens who are in homes and so on has been uh, put under a very uh, stark light. And uh, we know that probably one of the most important steps we can do right now is in terms of, uh, you know, if we were to incur more uh, pandemic-like issues as we we have to shore up that, and I'm very pleased to hear the discussion is starting, but uh, it's, uh, it's obviously a lot of work to do to, to get that into a reasonable state. One question from Rob Noble was, have any patients been on the MVM yet? And I think you made it clear later in the talk that that's not the case, but when, when might that be the case? Yeah, so, uh, well, it will be only the case once uh, in Canada, once they receive Health Canada approval in Italy, once they uh, receive the CE approval and so on. So in all cases, we are not using these on, on patients yet. And the interim orders do not require uh, testing on, on live patients uh, because the simulators are so advanced that they, they can simulate this very well. So they're happy with the data they get from the simulators. They will be taken next week into hospitals and they will be used in the hospitals, but not on patients. It's, it's mainly a usability test where uh, the doctors will be trying them out on simulators and making sure that uh, what they see looks good to them, that the uh, uh, nurses and uh, you know, respiratory therapists are, are handling them and feel that they are comfortable with them and that they, these will be acceptable. And that will be a, a critical part of the input to the Health Canada um, accreditation process. There's a question from Emily Darling. What is the cost per unit MVM? Uh, it, it varies a lot. Uh, well, for the for the MVM, it doesn't vary, but the ventilators run, uh, you know, the many tens of thousands to sort of the 10,000 scale. I, I don't know the exact details of the contract between government in Canada and, and Vexels. Uh, but I believe ours is closer to the bottom end of that. Uh, 
Uh, mm -hmm. So they're, they're cheap compared to others, but they are not cheap when you're buying in such large numbers. A question from Alex Pedersen. How long could a patient easily stay on an MVM ventilator? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we, we know that uh, ventilators are a, a last resort. Uh, it's only for the patients who are very, very sick, and it's to try and keep them alive so that they have a fighting chance to, to fight off the infections. Um, so the longer you are on a ventilator, it means the unhealthier you are in that respect. And uh, so the probability of survival, I suppose, goes down if you're, if you're having to be on that very long. I, I don't really know the complete answer. Uh, of course, ventilators are not gentle. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, you have a tube in your throat, which is uncomfortable. Uh, it is unnatural and so on. And so uh, you really don't want to be on a ventilator if you can avoid it. Uh, but they are designed to try to save lives of people who absolutely need to be on that ventilation. And I, I believe the time scale uh, is typically on the order of weeks. And, and you know, I've heard of uh, think people being on these things for up to three weeks, but I, I believe that probably spans the, the normal expectation. Uh, we have a couple more questions, but I'm just going to allow, I think, one, and the other one might actually be good for maybe a bit of a group discussion. So I'll save it to the end, because remember everybody, uh, all of our speakers will come back at the end and we'll do a bit of a group Q&A. But the last question I think is again going to Barbara Jancor is uh, what would be the difference between the MVM with a previous classical ventilators? Uh, well, actually our device is, is based very uh, closely to a very ancient ventilator called the Manley ventilator that was used back in the 50s or so, uh, which was very simple. Uh, it just used pressure to control and kept the number of parts down so that the you know, mean time to failure could be reasonably low and so on. Uh, the, the more advanced ventilators have more modes they can control if you want by controlling the flow as well as controlling the pressure. Uh, whereas we monitor the flow and control on pressure. They have, uh, you know, we, we have uh, you know, 50 parts or something like that. I don't know what the exact number is, but and uh, uh, whereas others have many tens of thousands of parts um, and much more sophistication in monitoring and so on. So th these are meant to be used in emergency situations where you need something to uh, sustain the patient, but they certainly don't have all the bells and whistles of uh, the more modern, if you like, uh, ventilators, which are also being built and are ramping up their, their ability to deliver on those. Um, it is the sort of thing that... Um, this ventilator is designed to be easily usable anywhere in the world. So if there was a cause to take this design or take these ventilators and, and transport them to some other uh, location that was in dire need, um, they're designed in simplicity that they would uh, be able to function in basically any ICU or hospital setting that we can think of uh, around the world. Well, it sounds like that'll be I mean, optionally very useful if and when we need them. Well, Tony, uh, thank you so much for sharing with us, and we look forward to having you come back at the end. But uh, we're going to move on to our second and final round of trivia. Um, a few more questions regarding COVID, and uh, before we bring on our last speaker. So I think you can, yeah. So I'm going to share my screen again, which always has the risk of it not actually working. And, uh, all right. So again, if you haven't, um, if you haven't, if you didn't join us at the beginning and you didn't get to join in the first round of trivia, that's fine. Here's the link. It's in the YouTube descri description. Uh, you can certainly fill in the next uh, the next uh, round and still submit them in. It's fun. And again, anybody that submits those will uh, be entered, and we might be interacting with you to send you some some fun trivia. So the next and final five questions. Question six. What is the expected net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in 2020, given how uh, it decreased over this small period of time? Is that going to be 50, 80, 90%, or maybe it's a lot smaller? And again, we'll accept a little bit of a small range. Question seven. 
while living in the pandemic might be a good reason to try to get off this planet like some astronauts recently, let's remember this space is certainly less hospitable for us, but there are some animals that don't seem to have maybe that much issue living in space. So a recent study actually looked at how well tardigrades or these water bears, these very microscopic uh, creatures, can survive in the vacuum of space. How long were most tardigrades able to survive in space? And a number of them did die shortly after, but they were able to reproduce first. So the question is, how long were the tardigrades able to survive in the vacuum of space? Question eight. In the year 1901, the first ever human virus was discovered, and it was the yellow fever virus. So the question is, who discovered the virus? Who was the scientist that found it? Question nine. It's a long one. And I probably worded it in the most complicated way possible. So the number of Facebook users in 2019 first increased in that first quarter by about 55 million people compared to the very end of 2018. So at the beginning of 2019, 55 million new users joined Facebook. <clears throat> and then through 2019, there was about a consistent uh, 41 million new people kind of joining every quarter. It was ranging from 35 to 49 million new users. So my question to you is, what is the coronavirus effect for 2020's first quarter new users? So by around March, specifically, how many more new users were there for this quarter compared to last year's? So the question is, is it 25 million extra this year compared to last? 50 million, 75 million more, or 100 million more? A, B, C, or D? And you should be able to select that of the four options. And last but not least, another picture round, or at least a picture assisted round. I'm showing you two pictures. Um, one of these is DNA and one is RNA. I'm not going to tell you which it is. And some viruses genetic material is encoded in DNA and some is in RNA. And so this two-part question is, which of the images A or B describes a coronavirus, the COVID-19 um, genetic code? And which is it? RNA or DNA. So you basically, oh, okay, so there's supposed to be a font over the images, which looks like they've disappeared. Um, basically, the image on your left is A, image A, and the image on the right is image B. So you would say in your answer, which image is it, and uh, is it DNA or RNA? Okay, one more time for all the questions. This maybe is your chance to get that second one. I'm running out. Oh, you can <laughs> virtual backgrounds. So this is my empty, broken glass because it has no beer in it. Question six, what is the expected net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in 2020? So the total over the whole year compared to say 2019. Question seven, while living in a pandemic might be good reason to try to get off this planet, let's remember that space is certainly less hospitable. However, a recent study looked at how well tardigrades or water bears can survive in the vacuum of space. How long were most tardigrades able to survive in space? How many days? And that's a hint. It is not minutes or hours. It is how many days. <clears throat> Question eight. In the year 1901, the first ever human virus was discovered. It was the yellow fever virus. Who discovered it? Question nine, the number of Facebook users in 2019 first increased by 55 million people in the first quarter compared to the last quarter of 2018. Throughout 2019, the number of users steadily increased by about 41 million people per quarter, ranging from 35 to 49 million new users for any given new quarter. So the question is, what is the coronavirus effect for 2020's first quarter new users? That is, how many more new users were there for this quarter compared to last year's. And is it 25 million new uh, users over last year, 50 million new users over last year's first quarter, 75 million or 100 million? Like I said, it's a little bit of a wordy, complicated question. And last but not least, picture round. One of these images is DNA and one is RNA. 
some viruses' genetic material is encoded in DNA and some in RNA. This two-part question is, which of the images A for left and B for right describes a coronavirus's genetic code and which is it, RNA or DNA? So you should either, you should, your answer should either be A, RNA, A, DNA, or B, RNA, B, DNA. And that's it for the trivia round. Think on that for a little bit. Make sure you submit that. We really appreciate any other information you put um, at, at the top, particularly about details about yourself. It lets us know how to better um, basically get information about these kind of events to you. At the end, there's an opportunity for us to give us a little bit of feedback. If you want to wait until the end of the event to, before sending that off, we understand. Um, but certainly do look forward to getting those from you all. And we'll be able to send uh, a few of you some cool, uh, cool swag. Okay, and last but not least, we are ready to move on to our last speaker. So Paul, would you be able to share your video? How's that? It's great, thank you for joining us. <laughs> so our final speaker, Paul, uh, is Paul Grogan. Paul, you are a professor of plant and terrestrial ecosystem ecology at the Department of Biology at Queen's University here in Kingston, Ontario. You've been here since 2003. And your research expertise is on how the plants, animals, and soil organisms of terrestrial... You've stolen my, my bio for you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Uh, uh, plants, animals, and soil organisms of terrestrial ecosystems interact with each other and with their physical environment. So humans and human activities are an inherent part of this ecosystem, and therefore ecosystem-level ecological perspectives are critical to understanding recent global change. Consequently, you have become keenly interested in kind of elucidating the fundamental root cause of our civilization's current environmental and social sustainability predicament. And in particular, you're focused on the following two questions. What can biology tell us about our future and how ought we be living it, or how ought we to be living? So today your talk with us is hoping that maybe some real good will come out of this COVID situation. So I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, hope is the word. And, and uh, so we've had two very interesting talks already. Um, this is a, a, another different one, if you like. And uh, in some senses, it's an, an attempt to put a positive spin or a positive angle on what is obviously a global crisis and, and a major problem. So, um, yeah, as you said, I've an expertise in, in terrestrial ecosystem ecology, Arctic climate change, that kind of thing. But today, I'm, for the last, personally, I've become more and more interested in sustainability, not just from an environmental point of view, but also from a, um, a social and a personal point of view. And I think that biology in particular has a lot to offer. Fundamental biology can help us to understand why we're where we're at right now, and more importantly, how we might be able to do something significant about it. And so I'm gonna set this in the context of fundamental biology, but you'll see that there's, I have a great affinity for astronomy, and I think it can be particularly important as a perspective, uh, likewise for philosophy. So I'm going to, uh, from your perspective, just treat me as another human being, grappling with the products of being conscious on a journey, trying to make sense of myself and my environment. So fasten your spacecraft belts and um, let's go. And as you'll see, I'm a very big picture person and I make no, mis no apology for that in this context, in this talk. So what I'm going to argue is that human activities on Earth are almost certainly heading us towards a major population crash and that we need nothing short of a paradigm shift, one that not only changes how our society and its economy functions, but more fundamentally, one that overcomes several of our core genetically endowed traits. To move toward a more sustainable society, we'll undoubtedly need extraordinarily creative technological solutions. And we've heard some, about some of the issues involved with that from, from Tony a minute ago. But in addition, we will also need to adopt a fundamentally different lifestyle that's aimed more at the good of the community than at the success, success of the individual or our family. And so my question really is, could the COVID event provide a much needed catalyst for the changes that we need to make? So with that introduction, I'm going to start out with a, uh, um, sorry, 
I'm trying to advance my screen here and I'm having a little, oh, there we go, there's the next slide. So this is a black screen because I want to tell a little story I want you to imagine. Imagine a small island in a lake on which maize and other seed-bearing plants are the dominant vegetation. Imagine that there were no animals on this island until one day an old barrel containing several mice drifts from the mainland onto the island's shore. The mice disembark and soon find themselves in a land of plenty. They feed, they grow, they reproduce. The mouse population rapidly increases over the years, albeit with occasional diebacks due to harsh winters, disease outbreaks, etc. At some point, it's almost certain that the mouse population will grow to a size where it begins to exceed the rate of food production from plants. At this stage, those individual mice that are stronger, more com competitive, and can reproduce more rapidly or to a greater number will tend to dominate the gene pool. The weaker, in other words, will tend to die off first. Nevertheless, if almost all the seeds are being consumed, there'll be little left to provide the basis for plant growth the following year. And so even the more competitive or best adapted mice will begin to die off. The crash in the mouse population is essential for the long-term viability of the system. Whatever seeds that remain during the crash have a much better chance of surviving to germinate, grow and reproduce in subsequent years, eventually renewing the food resource for the surviving mice. My point with this simple analogy is that cycles of population rises and crashes are typical of any species. It's a basic biological pattern and therefore the same fundamental drivers also apply to our own species. So now we're looking at an island, another island, a larger one, but it's still an island. It's a closed system in terms of resources. Obviously energy enters and energy is, is reflected back out, but in terms of resources, it's closed. The population can be expected to rise and fall for exactly the same fundamental biological reasons that I've described for mice. What further insights can fundamental biological prin principles offer us on why life has developed the way it has on that planet and why our civilization has now reached this sustainability crisis? Well, I'm going to address that by asking four questions. What are we? A species that's accomplished extraordinary things, great works of art, literature, great works of philosophy, a species that's come up with something called the UN Declaration of Human Rights. A species that's developed extraordinarily in terms of science and technology and technological advances. And yet, even all of those who are lucky, of us who are lucky enough to be above the poverty line still generally live discontented and insanely busy lives. We spend so much time, I do, and I'm sure many of the people watching, running around almost like headless chickens. We have the arrogance to call ourselves homo sapiens. In fact, the way we live our lives, those of us who are lucky enough to live above the poverty line, would be better described by homo insanus, insane man. Where have we come from? A 3.5 billion year evolutionary heritage of selection for various traits important biologically, genetically endowed traits, traits like competition, traits like resource accumulation, traits for reproduction. These are clearly, from what we understand the fundamental basis of, of evolution, these are traits that are favored by evolution to perpetuate the genes of the organism. In other words, they're genetically endowed. And we can go further than that. As we know, we have evolved from apes and we've developed all kinds of additional traits which are partly genetically influenced and partly cultural. Traits for escapism, as you can see with these people looking at their, their phones, etc. Traits for delusion. Here's a slide of um, a cinema where they're showing two movies, An Inconvenient Truth, which you may remember is about the climate change crisis, or A Reassuring Lie. And of course, many of us are more inclined to delude ourselves or deny problems and uh, choose, choose a different track, in, in other words, a lie. 
traits for self and ego. There are clear biological reasons why evolution would give us those traits. And so we must recognize that they're a part of us and part of the reason, therefore, why we're in the situation we're in. So what can biology tell us about our future? Here's a schematic that I drew several years ago and that I still think is quite useful. So we can imagine human activities occurring uh, on the planet. It requires all kinds of resources and of course technology has required new resources, but they're all present on earth. And we use those in some way and we produce waste as a result. And so uh, we can envisage this cycle turning. In other words, materials being used from resources and produced as waste. And if we're going to live sustainably, those wastes must be regenerated back to resources um, if we're going to actually have a closed and effective system and, if you like, perpetual life on the planet for the human species. Or at least that's one major criterion. So there's two features to this wheel. One is the size of the wheel, in other words, the, the, the thickness of it, the number of people. And that's clearly important in terms of the rate at which wastes are produced from resources and therefore the need for waste to be uh, regenerated back to resources. And the second thing is the resource use intensity per capita. In other words, each person's resource uses. And you and I know that in Canada, for example, we have relatively high resource use intensities. If you think about people living in sub-Saharan Africa, they have relatively low resource use intensities, but they aspire to having higher resource use intensities. So the combination of the two is what really drives our potential to be sustainable. And it, the same drivers, of course, are driving bacteria on a petri plate. You have different species, some become dominant, and of course they use resources in their various ways and produce waste, and then that waste builds up to, to such an extent that it can't be regenerated or it's not regenerated sufficiently, and there's a crash in the population. So for the human situation, of course, we've got a much larger population over time. We're now at 7.5 billion. When I was born 57 years ago, there were 3 billion on the planet, half, under half. Furthermore, our resource use intensity has increased greatly. So it may come as a surprise to you to know that as the, um, over the 20th century, the population grew by about a factor of four. GDP, gross domestic product, which is a, 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 an analog or a, a, an indicator, if you like, of resource use intensity, grew by a factor of 40. In other words, it's the combination of the growth increase in the size of the population, but in particular, it's the um, increasing use of capacity or resources by individuals that creates um, the major sustainability problems and the major waste problems that we're currently experiencing. So in this talk, I don't have time to go into those environmental impacts. It's just um, that take a course of me if you, or, or someone else for that matter. But these are, most people are generally aware that we are facing an environmental crisis. But the environmental crisis is only part of our predicament. And this is a big message. Humanity faces many interrelated problems. That interrelated word is really important because we tend to categorize and focus down on individual problems and try and solve those. But in this case, as you're going to see, we have many interrelated problems. And so, so just focusing on one is not going to do it. Just focusing on developing a vaccine is not going to solve the coronavirus problem, for example. Just focusing on climate change is not going to help with the um, land use degradation problem or the biodiversity problem, for example. So what I'm going to offer here is a way of conceptualizing all these problems together as a means to try and identify the fundamental causes. So here's an illustration which uh, I've been developing over time and I wonder what you think of it. So we can think of each problem as being a leaf as it were. And so here at the moment, of course, most people are concerned around the globe, rightly, with the disease from a virus. And there's a very there's evolutionary features to that, and new strains, as Troy mentioned, that have evolved and that are particularly virulent and contagious and therefore are causing a problem. Four months ago, global, globally, or at least certainly in Canada, we would be most concerned about climate change and maybe some other things that I'll mention in a second. We can also think about other environmental problems, land use change. 
So land use change is linked to climate change as we clear the forests in the tropical areas in particular, we're contributing to climate change because they're the breathing system for planet Earth to some degree. There are other problems represented along the environmental category, ocean pollution, habitat loss, biodiversity loss, etc. So that's on the environmental category. On the personal well-being category, of course, there's viruses and antibiotic resistance and those kinds of things, but there are also many other things that we should be really concerned about. Preventable physical health diseases, mental health issues, the opioid crisis, loneliness, electronic screen time and how it's grown so rapidly. And of course, that's just two sets of problems. There's a third set that's equally important. Industrialized food production, which in some ways incidentally has been linked as a potential cause of the outbreak of the coronavirus because apparently uh, many Chinese farmers have, have, small farmers have contracted and gone into the wild and used, started to harvest wild animals because of uh, major poultry production has started in, in large facilities and basically swamped them out so they've no other source of livelihood. There are other reasons too, but that's one of them. Well, maybe I'll talk about those other reasons right now while I think about it. So that virus has spread and is spreading very quickly. Um, and as Troy mentioned, there seems to be a link to bats and, and possibly to pangolins in terms of the initial infection of this uh, mutated uh, strain of the virus. Um, but of course, it's jumped over to a relatively new host, humans. And we've contributed and greatly exacerbated the impact of this virus because our population has grown so large because we live in high density situations, particularly in urban environments. And that may be one of the reasons why bats are significant in terms of carrying coronavirus and, and potentially passing it over to humans. It's because of course, bats live in, in um, urban environments too. Just as rats did in the bubonic plague, there can be an important vector. And finally, a third reason why humans have exacerbated the situation is because we travel so much. We're not doing it right now, obviously, but until four months ago, Many of us were zipping around the world at crazy rates and obviously moving the virus. So what became, was originally an epidemic rapidly became a pandemic across the whole global population. Okay, so just to hit on, on just a few of the other problems that humanity faces on the socioeconomic side, refugee migration is a major issue. Um, social inequality, this is a really big one. And of course the phrase Black Lives Matter, as Mark mentioned the, the march that's happening on Wednesday, these issues are related. If we're going to solve the virus problem, we've got to solve or at least address some of these social inequality issues. It's a very complex and in some ways overwhelming picture, this one. But the bark of the tree, the leaves are of these various problems. The hardwood at the center is the core. What's giving rise or explaining or causing or at least greatly exacerbating each and every one of these problems? Well, it's the combination of genes, our genes, our culture, and the history through which we've evolved. That combination together determines how we choose to live. And how we choose to live is either creating or greatly exacerbating every single one of the problems that we have there. I told you it was going to be big picture. Well, you can't get much bigger than that. So my hope, or at least my suggestion here, is that if we could fully acknowledge the realizations associated with the answer to the four questions I've just posed, that would catalyze our civilization towards a fundamentally different and more sustainable way of living. It's about awareness, awareness in the grander, deeper sense of the word, deep awareness, seeing the big picture around those kinds of problems that we talked about, but also another perspective, which I'm going to share and the astronomers will enjoy, will enjoy, I suspect. Here's an image that hopefully you've seen before. It's called the pale blue dot. And it was taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it retreated from the solar system, going out outside the solar system, in other words, uh, from about 6.4 billion kilometers back in 1990. And Carl Sagan was very much involved in this um, uh, expedition, etc. And he wrote very beautifully about this image. It was he who used the phrase pale blue dot. You can see it right in the center here. It's caught in a beam of light. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. 
That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Sagan goes on, our postures, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this pale point of light. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. Awareness of that is really important. So where does COVID come into all this? Well, as we know, COVID has caused immense suffering and, and quite a number of deaths and, um, and certainly dreadful things happening in um, um, retirement homes, etc. And we don't know yet, this is an image from India, just how big it's going to be in the developing world. My suspicion is that those ventilators that Tony was talking about are going to be particularly useful in the developing world. Where I've lived in India, I've lived in Nigeria, people live in very intense, densely populated areas, and it's very hard for them to keep separate. We know that COVID has had those horrible impacts. We also know that COVID has caused many of us to slow down. We can't go to restaurants. Flying is very difficult. There's been a huge economic crash. A lot of us, many are standing around waiting for welfare payments or waiting to queue to get groceries or whatever it is. We've been forced to slow down. Maybe there's a positive aspect to that. Maybe it would encourage reflection and re-evaluation. Maybe we'll get time to think. Maybe, just maybe, it could lead to a renaissance. Renaissance from the French, a rebirth. And of course, it was originally applied to the 15th century, a rebirth of civilization that happened after the Middle Ages. We need a rebirth. We need a renaissance if we're going to move into a more sustainable way of living, a more benign way of living. And so that's where COVID might help. So to summarize, um, what I'm really arguing here is that we need all kinds of changes. Changes, first order changes and second order changes. And I need to explain what I mean by that. So first order changes are relatively straightforward. For example, if um, you switch over to solar power instead of using fossil fuel, that's a first order change. It's a good thing and it's really important, reducing, reusing, recycling, that kind of thing. The things that we're pretty familiar with. Second order change is about changing the system, changing the way that it's structured and the way that it functions in a fundamental way. And that's why I use the term paradigm shift. If we're really going to address the sustainability issues, if we're really going to move towards more contented living and avoid that homo insanus analogy, we need second order change. We need to reprioritize our values and, and focus more on escapism rather than, uh, sorry, focus more on realism rather than escapism and denial. Escapism, the idea that we can, our economy can keep growing perpetually, it's simply not possible. But yet we vote on that kind of basis. Reprioritizing for well being over success as, as it's traditionally used, our progress as we tend to think about it. Reprioritizing to favor compassion 
over individualism. We've become a very individualistic society. A reprioritization to favor respect as a form of motivation rather than fear and anger as a form of motivation. And I think we're all familiar with examples of the latter. Reprioritization to, about sharing with and being a part of rather than owning nature. That's a fundamental difference. Indigenous people in Canada are very strong in the idea we can't own nature. It's, it's a facile idea. And of course, we persist with it to our detriment. Reprioritization towards slowing down. And I've mentioned some of that idea before. There's a famous phrase, um, don't just sit there, do something. Well, actually, maybe we would be better off to don't just do something, but sit there. Not sit there and watch the TV or Netflix or something like that, but sit a bit slowly and reflect. What really matters? What's really important in our lives? So to sum up, I just have a couple of um, summary points to, to bring it all together. Today's environmental sustainability crisis is entirely to be expected from fundamental biological principles. Any species that becomes dominant would reach that same point most likely. Secondly, humanity faces many other problems, and they too are all caused or else severely exacerbated by the same ultimate root cause, our behavior, how we are choosing to live, which of course is driven by a, the combination of our genes, our culture, and our history. This is fundamental biology. However, of course, our species is unique in that addition to those core genetic traits associated with growth, survival, reproduction, competition, etc., we also have consciousness. We can be aware of our situation. We can look in at it, as Carl Sagan did. We can observe our environment and see how it's being impacted. We can be aware of our existentiality. Therefore, we have the capacity to potentially rise above our base genetic drives, which will always be with us, but maybe we can suppress to live more maturely, to live to our full potential, to live more wisely and to achieve more contented living. You and I know, as you're watching this, that we are all here together, all of humanity, sitting on the edge of a planet, spinning around in the middle of nowhere. We know that, and yet every moment of every hour of every day, almost, we spend our time living, distracting ourselves with the conceits that Sagan wrote about. Knowing what we know, in other words, full awareness, we should be prioritizing above all else, looking after and respecting ourselves, each other, other species and the environment as one single interconnected system, which of course it is at the biological and philosophical levels. And I'll share a quote from Einstein, obviously physics most famous uh, scientist, who basically says the same thing. So the paradigm shift in our mindset would involve a reprioritization of values and what we mean and want in terms of quality of life and thus will drive that second order change in the whole way that society, politics, and the economy is structured and functions. One example of a second order change would be if you could imagine that political decision-making could occur without the influence of lobby groups. That would be a fundamental change. And it would have, those kinds of changes would have enormous impacts on all of the problems that humanity faces. The COVID crisis provides the conditions for that reprioritization. Maybe it could awaken us to the awareness I spoke of. Maybe some real good would come out of COVID. So I'll stop there. I hope that's been interesting and will lead to further discussion after today and uh, on into the future. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much. <clears throat> I feel like just like sitting here and thinking and reflecting. <laughs> Um, no, that's a really interesting, interesting topic, and it's something to, it's an interesting way to end the night, I think, not that we're exactly into the night yet, but um, we do have a, a few questions that are slowly coming in. Um, 
One question I have for you, and this is for me, is I'm wondering, like, I, I recognize that, you know, we don't have the answers to this yet, um, but I'm curious to know if you have any kind of, I don't know, like, I feel like to make change, it's useful to, like, really think about what those actions are for us. Mm -hmm. And this is such a fundamental change for all of us. Do you have any suggestions for, like, what, what could our next step be? What should we be doing right now? Yeah, so, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I do have, a, I made another slide. I made a couple of slides. If I can show those, I, I, I'd like to. Um, so, there we go. Yeah, you guys can see that now. Yep. Um, so here's, you know, there are first order changes. So engaging in community activism, for example to improve policy. Everybody's familiar with that. Making environmentally conscious decisions, buying a hybrid car or whatever. Um, querying vested interests in short-term planning. Critiquing alarm bell words. More. Busy. Growth. Success. If you think about what I said much earlier on, you'll see that those words have a link right back to some of the core base genetically endowed traits that we have for resource accumulation, for being busy, for um, succeeding as it were, etc. So they're all pre probably pretty familiar to most of your audience. Um, it's the second order ones, the paradigm shift, that are more difficult to handle, but clearly in my view need to be done. So here's some ideas on that. First of all, embrace the big picture realities. In other words, we know that populations will rise and fall. So therefore we can expect as a dominant species that there will be rises and falls. And we can plan for that to soften the blows as it were. We know that we have base and advanced genetic traits which give rise to the behaviors we have. And so we know that the reasons that we do, a lot of the things that we do are to some extent influenced by our genes, also by culture for sure. We know in terms of realities about the concept of impermanence. We don't like it. We continuously look away from it, whether it's to do with the self, the idea that our own species might come extinct, that our environment will change. We tend to deny and much more focus on the delusion of permanence. This doesn't help our situation. We know about interconnectedness and interdependence, but we tend to ignore it, or not ignore it, but overlook its significance. We know that suffering is an inherent component of all lives. Each of us watching this suffers in our own way, as well, of course, as people who are much more less lucky than we are, in other words, who are living in harsher conditions. And here's some ideas about how we could enhance the capacity of our consciousness. Remember, that's that extra trait, as it were, that we have, that we might be able to use to suppress some of those more base genetic traits for reproduction, etc. Slowing down making time for reflection, paying attention. Some people do mindfulness, those kinds of things. Mixing with people outside your normal walks of life to appreciate all the different ways that life is lived by people alone. Volunteering or connecting with the sick, the elderly. Getting out of your silo, in other words. Doing and sticking with activities that you're not so good at. That's a good thing to do. You don't have to be brilliant at everything. And if you're not brilliant at something, that doesn't mean you should dispense with it. It recognizes the reality of your capabilities. Immersing yourself in nature is well recognized as a way of helping you to appreciate your relationship to nature and therefore perhaps acting in a more sustainable way. Being skeptical of anthropocentric human-based perspectives that result in commodification and exploitation. And that's not just of resources like forests, it's of people too, right? Being grateful for nature's gifts to you. This is very strongly a view. Uh, you mentioned the decolonization issues early, earlier on, Mark. This is a very strong issue for Canadian Indigenous people, and we could greatly benefit from it. And last but not least, maybe the overall catch-all. Striving for the combination of compassion and wisdom in how we treat ourselves, each other, other species and our environment. I genuinely believe that those are the kinds of ways in which we can begin to move forward towards the second order change that we kind of need. Thanks for the question.
So there's a question from Rob Noble. He says that I agree that slowing down our privileged life in Canada is good for the world and probably good for us. How can the same fundamental change help people in less privileged places? Um, because um, the slowing down aspect of things is uh, essentially whether one is rich or poor, whether it's living in, in um, a relatively comfortable situation or unless you're literally living from hand to mouth, of course, in which case you've only got one concern in life. Um, but for the rest of us, um, the idea of slowing down allows time for reflection. In other words, allows people to pay more attention to the present moment rather than spending so much time being apprehensive about the future, which of course is essentially a byproduct of our consciousness trait. Our consciousness is a very useful trait. We can plan for the future, but then of course we know there is a future and we become anxious about it in all kinds of ways. And so um, this, the benefits of this apply to all people, apart from those, as I said, who are really just living from hand to mouth, I think. A, a, it's almost more a comment than a question. Um, oh. it's, it's from Ed Thomas. There are many materially poor societies, and that poor is in quotation marks, that seem to be happier than our materially rich societies. Do they really aspire to our lifestyle or, or do we aspire to theirs? Yeah, so um, I think in general, most people would like to have a washing machine and their own vehicle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we know from basic biology, that spinning wheel that I had earlier on, that if everybody on the planet has that, we've all got a problem because we are all in this together. The COVID is a great example of that. So imagine that Canada solves the COVID problem within Canada. The problem is not solved. You and I are not safe in Canada because obviously people can come from other parts of the world and bring it in. So um, at the sustainability level, the same thing applies. So, for example, um, people in poorer countries, we need to bring them up to a certain standard of living so that they can be reasonably content. Um, we would be wise to discourage them from going to the excesses that we've done, because obviously that hasn't really benefited us and has actually damaged them as well in terms of, say, global CO2 emissions, for example. So there's a balanced perspective on that. Mm. Thank you for giving us your insights on that. Um, I think that's the last of the questions for now. I'm going to um, shortly break to do answers for the trivia round, and then we're going to do kind of a group huddle. I wanted to highlight one thing that you did say, which I really like want to uh, ascribe to, because my natural state is to do the opposite, which is, I think you said, encourage people to do activities they find difficult. And um, I'm trying to change to a bit to a growth mindset over a fixed mindset where you really need to embrace what's hard because that's where you learn and you grow. And I, so I, when I try to deal with some other circumstances, we really hear about embracing the uncomfortable too. Mm -hmm. It's another opportunity, right? To really understand like, you know, what is it that's making us uneasy and why are we not okay sitting in that? Um, yes. So yes. I really appreciate you uh, kind of yeah. uh, encouraging that. Okay, so thanks again for your talk. I'm going to do the trivia responses. So if you could stop your video and then I'm gonna bring all the speakers sure. back to do a, a last minute uh, kind of a group huddle. <laughs> and while I try to share my screen. Do, do, do. So now it's time for answers. So hopefully, so I'm just marking the time. It is 9.03 p.m. So I think we've gone a little bit longer than we originally planned. So I really appreciate all the questions that were coming in. But now it is 9.03. I'm cutting off your trivia answers. Um, so please submit those now um, if you want to be considered for the winner prize um, before I obviously reveal some answers. So whoop, I'm having the same issue that, there we go. So question number one was, with industrialization reduced during this time, greenhouse gas emissions dropped compared to the same period before the COVID-19 era. This drop peaked early in April. What was the percentage drop? And the answer is, and I've closed off the trivia submission process. I can do it officially. No worries. And it was 17%. So the peak was around 70%. A few sources are saying maybe closer to 20%. We're accepting anything between 15 to 20%. But it's a pretty considerable amount, except I, I was at a talk recently, well, at a talk, I wish, 
I attended through Zoom a talk at, at, uh, at uh, Oxford, and they made the point that think about all the travel, all the commuting that has been shut down, and we only brought it down, you know, 17%. So it's clearly more kind of established fixed sources that are um, what we need to kind of attack in the future for, um, for maybe conquering uh, climate change or whatnot. Question two, what other recent viruses were also coronaviruses? And remember there were two, and they are MERS um, and SARS, which we heard uh, from, about both of them from Troy earlier today. Question three is, what is the term for a quickly spreading contagious disease affecting a large geographic region? That would be a pandemic. Um, technically an epidemic, you could argue whether it's, um, it maybe is the same. They are quite similar, but epidemics usually are a smaller scale or not quite as contagious. So pandemic was the correct answer. And maybe I should put that on the screen. <laughs> Question four, what is the official name of the virus as designated by the World Health Organization? And that was SARS-CoV-2, also spoiled for us by Troy. <laughs> Question five, given the pictures, in what year did Max Delbruck, Alfred D. Hershey, and Salvador E. Luria, pictured here, receive the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine? for their discoveries concerning the replication mechanisms and the genetic structures of viruses. That was 1969. Another kind of exciting first for 1969, right? It was what Apollo uh, 11 first went to the moon. Just kind of reminded me of uh, SpaceX putting up astronauts first time as a commercial enterprise into space. Okay, round two, question six. What is the expected net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in 2020? So we already heard that at its peak, it had dropped 17%, but that was a small period of time. For the whole year, what are the forecasts saying it's gonna be reduced? It's about 8%. And so we only accepted about seven to 9%. Maybe we'll accept 10 in the end. Question seven, while living in a pandemic might be good reason to try to get off this planet, let's remember that space is certainly less hospitable. A recent study looked at how well tardigrades or waterbirds can survive in the vacuum of space. They took tardigrades up to space and did this test. How long were most tardigrades able to live? I think it was over about 60% or more of the tardigrades lived for 10 days. It's a long period. Maybe they are pre precursors to the xenomorphs, the aliens from the alien uh, craft. They seem to be able to live in space too. Question eight, in the year 1901, the first ever human virus was discovered. The first uh, virus was discovered about a decade before. It was the yellow fever virus was the first human virus. Who discovered that virus? It was Dr. Walter Reed. Question nine, the number of Facebook users in 2019 first increased by 55 million people in the first quarter compared to the end of 2018. Through 2019, the number of users was steadily increasing by about 41 million every quarter, ranging from 35 to 49. So the question was, what is the coronavirus effect for Facebook? in 2020, what was the first quarter's new users, or at least how many more new users were there for the quarter, for this quarter compared to last year's? And the options were 25, 50, 75, or 100 million. And the answer is about 50 million more users this year over what the new number of users were last year. And specifically, that means there was 105 million users added to Facebook um, in the first quarter, 50 million more than it was introduced last year. In question 10, last but not least, was, and now the A's and the B's in there. One of these is DNA and one is RNA. Some viruses, genetic materials is encoded in DNA and some in RNA. This two-part question is, which of the images, A or B, describes a coronavirus as genetic code and which is it, RNA or DNA? And the answer is, it's RNA and so that is B. So image B is an example of RNA. So you can tell between the single double strand that doesn't curve back on itself, and RNA is uh, basically it's a it's still a, a strand that doubles back on itself to make a, a helix. Okay, that's the end of trivia. So I, there were a few questions that were not able to be answered at the time. So let's bring back all of our speakers, and I want to thank them all again. Um, so Tony, Troy, Paul, do you want to show your video? And let's make this kind of cool square. Thank you all. Um, and uh, so yeah, so I can, I can applaud for you. So I really appreciate all of your uh, questions, all of your talks tonight. And I do have a few extra, I'm pressing the wrong 
Um, so, and, and people still tuning in at home, we can certainly still take more questions. I don't know if we have a pressing place to be. This beer is still, you can see it still has ways to go. So I'm in no rush to go, not that I'm the spotlight right now. So I wanted to begin, um, do any of you guys have questions for each other? Uh, I have a question for Paul. Mm. So you suggested that the uh, coronavirus might lead people to, you know, as a, maybe a catalyst to slow down uh, and maybe start to kind of instigate some of these changes you talk about. One of the things I've noticed, though, is that with coronavirus and working from home, Zoom meetings now happen at the drop of a hat. So there's no planning often before you get called to a meeting. They happen any time of day. They happen any day of week. So in some ways, it seems worse than it was when I was going into work physically. Hmm. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I, I feel that myself to some degree. I think that um, I, in some countries are talking about making change, like, for example, having a four day week in New Zealand has apparently has been proposed as an idea. Um, I, I, there's a couple of things that strike me. One is that, of course, the, the, one of the issues about screen time and being at home is that one is more individual. One is less part of a community because of the barriers, etc., and so it even pushes us further along that individualistic road. So that's not a positive thing from my perspective. I would suspect, you know, in terms of the kinds of issues I was talking about. Um, so one would hope that as people get, we're in a very initial phase at the moment, and everybody's zooming, etc., 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 that somehow we'll begin to constrain the barriers because we need time off. There's a huge I mean, people are talking about the second wave and all that possibilities. The mental health problems that are probably happening and that will become apparent over the next year are likely to be very significant, I suspect. Um, I don't have data on that, but I suspect that's the case. And therefore, I assume that at that point, there'll be a backtrack, as it were, and we'll have to sort of constrain our times because we need time off. We need time to do other things. We need time. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that I've observed that I think is a, <clears throat> a benefit in some sense that's come out of COVID is just the, uh, in many cases, the response of humanity in the way that they have celebrated the frontline workers, mm -hmm. people singing on their balconies, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. It's a, it's a very heartwarming experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the big point, I'm not sure if I made it quite clear, so I'll just take this point. What we don't want to do is go back to normal. So you hear about people saying, when will we get back to normal? And my point is, we don't want to go back there because that's bad news from a sustainability perspective. We really need to use this as a way to change things dramatically. And the kind of com community perspectives that came out and those Italians singing on the balconies and all that kind of stuff. Um, provides hope. The fact that people are turning out to Black Lives Matters, I was at the one at Skeleton Park uh, on Tuesday, there were a large number of people there, they were well separated, most of them had masks on, people were doing it responsibly, um, but there's a sense of community going on, which is quite interesting, I think. Of course, four or five months, well, certainly six months ago, there were the climate change, Greta Thunberg and the marches, and people were turning out for that, so our focus has shifted a bit. My point, of course, is we want to think about these things in combination. Tony, I think you flagged that you had a, a question about the second wave for Troy. Well, I was just wondering, you know, if I was building a model and I've done you know, sorts of things like that in physics, uh, how would I build a model that uh, tried to predict whether or not a second wave was coming and what would be the, the, you know, the seeds that I needed to put in the model to try and predict that? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the million dollar question, I think, that's on everybody's mind as things have slowed down. Uh, if you look at past pandemics, um, like, say, the 1918 flu pandemic, there have been multiple waves. Uh, of course, it's a bit unclear what generated those. So there's been analyses of various sorts to try and answer that. Uh, the thinking is a lot of it has to do with seasonality and whether that's a combination of seasonality with something like weather, strictly speaking or whether it's seasonality in terms of behavior of people, like the opening and closing of schools and that sort of thing. Uh, it's probably a combination of the both. And so uh, 
you know, their thinking is that that probably, given most respiratory diseases seem to have that seasonal pattern, we might expect something to happen in the fall or winter with COVID-19 as well. And so that's one aspect of the way people could be, you know, you can sort of think of the second wave in a couple of ways. That aspect of it, will there be one in the winter like maybe you might expect there to be with other respiratory viruses? Uh, people also sometimes when they say second wave, they mean like what's going to happen as we start to relax the social distancing measures that are in place right now. So throughout the remainder of the summer, for example, is there going to be an increase again? Uh, and that I think is unclear too. I mean, it's bound to go up again if we relax things too much, just because as far as we know, there's very little herd immunity. Uh, but how much we can relax things before that happens, I think it's not so clear and how big of a wave and how easily we can bring it back under control are not so clear. So you'd want to include those sorts of things in a model. Seasonality, if we knew that it was important, certainly the changes in behavior due to seasonality, we, we know are going to be important. Um, and, and herd immunity as well. I mean, those are the key ingredients and, and that will drive what happens. But unfortunately, there's a lot of unknowns about each of those things still. One of the things I noticed was that in Sweden, they didn't really do any social distancing, and yet their rate of transmission doesn't look to be significantly higher than any other country. So that's changed. Their, if you look on a per capita level, their mortality has been the highest in the world over certain periods of time recently as well. And, and their health minister or whatever the equivalent of a health minister is in their in Sweden uh, has now acknowledged that what they did is probably not what they should have done. They should have done something, maybe well, the argument was in between what they did and what the rest of the world did. Uh, so I think their choices were not the right choices and the data is starting to bear that out. Well, well, not the right choices in terms, I guess it depends what your goal is, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> right. Troy, you had a, a cool plot about like rescaling, well, not rescaling, but repositioning all the provinces from the hundredth person or hundredth case. And I'm curious to know, like, why is there so much variability between the provinces? Are your models, like you showed models showing Ontario's behavior. Um, yeah. I was curious, like, do your models get that kind of variability between these geographic locations? So, I don't have, and I don't know of any yet, models for the Canadian setting that are uh, looking at geographic areas individually, but having them be interconnected as a result of movement of individuals between them. So presumably that plays a big role in what happened. So if you think of what happened in Kingston, for example, it's been, we've been pretty lightly affected by it in terms of numbers. Uh, and I think that's a combination of having a great public health unit here who are really on top of things and, and some elements of luck. I mean, things happened elsewhere and we saw them happening elsewhere and we started to impose measures here before anything really took off here. And so uh, I think, you know, there are elements of variability from one region to another as a result of that as well. I was talking to someone in Newfoundland today and they were thinking the same thing. I mean, they've been relatively lightly hit by it as well compared to other regions. And so they're wondering, are there better or maybe not better, but different ways they should be dealing with it there than somewhere like Ontario, where, you know, there they could imagine maybe eradicating it even, at least locally, temporarily. Ontario, it's not so clear that that's something that's a, that's a possibility, at least at this stage. And New, Ze New Zealand apparently is on the verge of getting rid of it too, right? So it's, I mean, Again, there's some element of isolation that I think is helpful. Uh, and I think Kingston enjoys a bit of that, despite being on a major route between big cities. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Tony, there was um, a couple of questions for you. One question was, what was the most striking thing that you really felt like learning, working in that kind of project in that new environment? It's a little bit some of the question that was asked to Troy. Um, well, maybe one thing that struck me, and it was, uh, I have always felt that physicists are a rather eccentric group, which if you put 10 in the room, you will find 10 different opinions. And uh, 
first of all, I, I was pleased that we were able to, to come together. Uh, but one of the struggles we had was if you take 10 medical doctors and put them in the same room together, they will have 10 different opinions on the right, right way to build a ventilator and so on. And so um, being able to develop a consensus on how to build something that would be highly functional with many different uh, opinions uh, just was something that we had to work through as a collaboration. And that was uh, inspiring, but also... Uh, enlightening in those in the sense that I see that the, our community is not unique in this way. And another question was, why did you go through the FDA first? Uh, well, uh, the, the FDA uh, was had, had set up for this emergency use um, and uh, we were partnered with the US. The US Air Force was engaged and was going to facilitate uh, getting um, the process handled. So basically the, the US Air Force was leading the way and uh, working with FDA and creating the documentation and so on. Um, the, uh, of course, there was a connection in the sense that uh, both Health Canada and uh, you know, other agencies had said that uh, if uh, you can get FDA uh, certification, that would be an important step towards uh, making it a, an easier path, if you like, as you go towards Health Canada. Of course, all of these uh, institutes were in flux themselves as they were trying to figure out how to define the proper way to go forward. Uh, so it was very useful for us in just the way they, our resources lined up. Um, it, it wasn't really a matter of going there first and that, uh, you know, other, other agencies were dragging their heels. It was a logical plan at the time of the way we wanted to proceed just to be able to take incremental steps uh, towards uh, full certification. Question for you as a group, like, what have you found the most different about now working in this environment. Like you guys are probably all used to working with people around the world. So that element of your work hasn't really changed, but what is it that's really like, you find like shockingly different or difficult about working and doing science in this new environment? Well, I find um, one of the things that I struggle with is the fact that I, I love travel on the other hand, um, I agree with uh, what Paul said uh, about the amount that we travel and, and the consequences that have. And, you know, in part, I mean, getting together in person can be very important, but I think we have all proven rather well that it's not necessary. And so I expect that uh, in the future, we will see a lot more remote activity, removing the necessity or the, uh, the uh, deemed necessity to travel. And I, I think that will be a good thing. And maybe I'll be reserving my travel more for uh, travel for uh, enjoyment of seeing the, the, the rest of the world. Yeah, I'll just add one quick thing to that. Uh, the other thing I've noticed along those lines is you know, every department I'm sure has their own seminar series where they bring speakers in regularly. And with this happening now, there are loads of seminar series that are like this, you know, and the lineup of speakers that are in these sem seminar series now are, are fantastic because they're just one after the other of people that you wouldn't normally be able to bring them all in. And so in some ways that's been really interesting and successful, I think too. And I don't know that it'll necessarily completely replace in-person seminars, but but it has again indicated that it's possible to do these sorts of things remotely in some aspects that are actually better that way. Yeah, for me, you mentioned you put it in the context of travel, Mark, and, and uh, so I do quite, most of my great work is in the Arctic, on climate change in the Arctic and, and various aspects of Arctic ecosystems. And obviously I can't go. This year it's not possible for somebody from the south to go to the north. So that's a huge change in terms of replanning various activities and student activities and that kind of stuff so that's that's quite big um, <clears throat> the other one is for me uh, is the fact that for example we know the fall term is going to be online teaching only and um, we are, we're all researchers but we all teach as well and um, I think for some people they don't really mind so much but for me and for some of my colleagues 
not being able to be live in a classroom and ask live questions in a way that you can feel as well as see the answer is, is um, very, very fundamental in terms of, I'll, I'll do the online stuff, I'll do it as well as I can, but I don't think it's going to match that experience from my perspective. And I don't think it'll match the experience for the student either. And especially in things like tutorials, I just can't imagine how I'm going to conduct tutorials in a meaningful way where body language is as much of anything in terms of you know, figuring out how much they understand and so on. Mm. It'll be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tony, there was another question for you specifically. You mentioned that in building the ventilator, you had to do things differently from how you normally build, test, tinker elements of your research. Do you think, are you taking anything from that? Do you see anything, um, do you see yourself applying any of those new techniques, those new different approaches to your regular research? Well, I was thinking in particular about the, the approach that was taken for the software, where we uh, developed all of the software and the device worked uh, perfectly in, in many regards. But in the end, we had to throw it all out and restart. And we programmed the entire thing from scratch, following uh, quality control procedures that tested everything in a certain ways. And, and uh, that has led to an enormously more robust software program. And so I, I do think that people will take that to heart. I think they will slide back a little bit into their old traits. It's, it's kind of unavoidable. But uh, the, I think whenever you work with a different group, um, I mean, I hope that uh, some of the people we worked, some of the things we do will have rubbed off on them and, and vice versa. And I, I, yeah, I, I can see a lot of things that we are doing and the discussions we've had with manufacturers and medical people has, is going to impact the, the way we do things. So I'm seeing that we're getting close to 9.30, and I think we will be wrapping up. Um, there was a question for you, Troy, um, and then I think I'm going to give all of you guys a chance in case you had some kind of closing statement, no pressure, putting you on the spot. Um, oh, no, those both those questions were actually already answered, Troy, so I think I'll just put you guys on the spot. I don't know if you have anything you want to kind of say in reflection of the whole the whole evening about um, yeah about what we've heard tonight about how you're kind of able to communicate your science to the public um, and about how maybe we, we we get to move forward from here well I think in terms of the way we connect to the public um, at least through the McDonald Institute largely due to the team that you that is supporting this uh, enterprise tonight we've been able to continue that but I still feel that um, there's a certain amount of time in lockdown that people are gonna be comfortable with and that we are nearing the end of that. Uh, and I, I worry that uh, the mental health issues uh, are just gonna to start to explode if people cannot begin to socialize a little bit. Uh, you know, it's been since March, it's been, I don't know, 80 or 90 days now that people have been living in this somewhat artificial way. Um, and although I, I agree, we probably don't want to go back to quote normal, uh, I do believe that uh, this is tiring in many, many ways that it's really starting to strain. And so um, I, you know, if we can't go out, I think people will go out and that might be a big problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I guess the, uh, not really the devil's advocate, but uh, you know the other side of that. I think it's important for people to recognize, though, is you often get the feeling I do, at least, in talking to people occasionally that they think you know we're over the hump. This is kind of over. That was a bit of a pain, and now we're coming out of it, and we'll get back to how things were. And and in reality, we're not over it in any way yet. I mean, if we let go of things now, it will come back. Whether that's the right thing to do because we have to for mental health issues or economic reasons is a separate question. But if we let go right now, there's nothing that will prevent it from coming back. So it's not as though we've solved the problem and it was a bit of a pain, but now we're done. I think we're still in the middle of things. We have to figure out the right way to do it in the next steps that are not gonna result in an explosion of the cases, but at the same time, people are gonna be able to have some semblance of a normal life again. Do you advocate for a system of, of 
you know, maybe opening things up, but very, very closely monitoring for basically re restarting this process of being in, in kind of self isolation until things return and do these things called riding the wave. Yeah, I mean, the other thing we've been looking at are, you know, things like uh, if you take schools, for example, it's probably not a good idea to go back to having school terms exactly as they were if nothing changes between now and September because, you know, it's a breeding ground for these sorts of outbreaks. But you could do things to introduce greater amounts of social distance within schools. You could break schools into, you know, rotating schedules of students and the same for workplaces and, and things like that that would allow people to start to have more interaction and greater economic activity while at the same time trying to ultimately basically limit the density of people that are contacting one another in the same place at the same time. Yeah, I would just echo what Troy said there. I mean, from the fundamental biology perspective, this is a highly contagious virus. It's highly virulent. That hasn't changed. And so until it's completely controlled either by vaccination, um, we're gonna have the likelihood of significant further outbreaks, it seems to me. So that's one thing. I guess the other thing I would just want to go back, right back to your first question, Mark, about what, what can people do? And I answered it in a certain way, but I, there was one element I didn't. And if you don't mind, I'll just finish by doing that. So at the moment, the governments of many countries, including Canada, are putting out huge subsidies uh, that are supporting individuals um, and also private sector companies and institutions. And if we're really going to catalyze the kind of change that I've been talking about, it's going to be really important that those subsidies are handed out in ways with strings attached, which reflect the kinds of values that I was talking about. So, for example, um, the nursing home issue and how they're managed and how they're structured, there are all kinds of issues in there that I think we can all guess at. But uh, the Green New Deal ideas are out there. Um, I suspect that they will get more, more, more power, more energy, as it were. The Black Lives Matter, we talked about that. But the big one for Canada, or one of the really big ones, is the fossil fuel industry and, and the airline industry. And in both cases, large amounts of money are being speculated as being handed over to keep these companies afloat. And I understand the rationale in terms of keeping jobs going and all that kind of thing. But obviously that's perpetuating the fossil fuel problem. And maybe this is a time to rethink that. Obviously we have to cope with the, or help the people who would be directly impacted by that. But it doesn't make sense to be putting billions of dollars to support industries that are doing damage. So there's food for thought. Not everybody will agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think without incentives, none of that can naturally happen, I think, in our economy. And Nobel Prizes have, have focused on that. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you to our audience for um, my point of the screen off screen. Thank you to our audience for joining tonight and sticking with us and joining with the trivia. We really, really enjoyed um, sharing with you and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and, and stay safe, take care, and do what you need to do to stay healthy. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks to the rest of the team. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank